November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving. Dan Cooper, also known as D.B. Cooper, shows up at the Portland, Oregon airport looking like your average business traveler. Clean-shaven dude in a business suit, holds a small paper bag and a briefcase. He pays $20 in cash for a short flight to the Seattle-Tacoma SeaTac Airport. Witnesses would claim later he looked like he was about 35 to 40 years old, he had receding black hair, wore wraparound sunglasses, and chain smoked. The Portland ticket agent he approached at the counter that day, Hal Williams, gave him seat 18C and coach. He'd be taking Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 305, a Boeing 727 with a capacity of 94 passengers. Only 37 customers would be on board for the half-hour jaunt that day. Shortly after takeoff, D.B. Cooper got the attention of stewardess Florence Schaffner and handed her a note. She assumed it was one more in a long line of come-ons for men traveling by themselves on business because apparently that happened all the time in the 1970s. She stuffed the unread note in her pocket and headed down the aisle. When she came back down the aisle, D.B. Cooper waved her over, motioned for her to lean in close, looked directly into her eyes, and calmly said, You'd better read that. I have a bomb. And that is how the mysterious man we know by the name of D.B. Cooper kicked off one of the very few successful airplane hijacks in U.S. aviation history. And this mystery is thoroughly explored, including who investigators, both professional and amateur, think D.B. Cooper really was on today's Can You Believe the Balls Out of That Guy? I Can't Believe That He A. Did That and B. Seems To Have Gotten Away With It edition of Time Suck. You're listening to Time Suck. Happy fucking 2019, time suckers. Woo! Yep, yep, yeah! Ready or not, it's here. We're doing it. We all made it. All of us listening made it. Uh, you know, is, is the quantification of time itself just a social construct? Kind of. I mean, seasons are real, though. Seasons are real, but it's, us, it's up to us to decide what we uh, call rotations around the sun, how we divvy up, you know, the, the space in between, you know, daybreak and the day end, I guess. As we rotate around the, the, the sun, you know, flat earthers, and we do rotate around the sun. Uh, you could say it's just another number, it's just another day, yeah. But I think it's also an opportunity to begin anew. I'm a big believer in beginning anew. I've had a phoenix tattoo in my back since I was about 22 years old. Uh, I think it's since I was exactly 22 years old. So let's do it. Let's, let's rise from the ashes of 2018. Take a new shape. Even if that shape is a replay of last year's shape, uh, get after those new goals, even if they're just a continuation of last year's goals. I'm Dan Cummins, Lucifina's meat sack sock puppet, Bo Jangles chew toy, Nimrod's symbolic cocker spaniel to stomp, and you are listening to Time Suck. This is the cult of the curious. Uh, we got some learning for your learning muscle today. Oh man, I'm gonna suck you off today. I'm gonna suck you so hard. I'm gonna suck your knowledge wing, your memory sponge, your trivia organ. I'm gonna suck it so hard. Hail Nimrod. Uh, but first, Small limited run of fun, silly, uh, of a fun, silly new shirt is available. Hopefully Space Lizards haven't gobbled all of them up already. I think there's some left, because when these are gone, they're gone. So you gotta, you gotta grab it quick. That's not just a sales pitch, there really is not gonna be many left. Uh, grab an A-Hole Air Banjo Academy t-shirt. Reserve your slot in the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy. Plink, 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 plink. You want skills like that? Get in the A-Hole Air Banjo Academy. You get a free air, air banjo with each purchase. Seriously, it's a, it's a joke, but you do get something, a real thing that will make sense if you get the shirt. In addition to the shirt, you get a, a real uh, air banjo, if you will. But it's not just air, but it's not a banjo either. You get something to pretend to play. You can pretend to play this thing. And you should send your A-hole air banjo submission video playing your new air banjo to Bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com or just post it online using one of the hashtags which comes with the free surprise. Uh, it'll tell you how to do it. It's, uh, the shirt is made of 312% pure domestic piney beard puke. Hey, look at here now. Have some puke. Blink, 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 blink. Uh, it's made of another 100% Tug River Valley gunpowder. Uh, the shirt makes inbreeding legal, dentistry frowned upon, it goes perfectly with any kind of overalls. Uh, and it gives a gives a yuck 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 legitimacy at both bluegrass jamborees and backwood moonshine distilleries. So get to air plucking, plinking, and planking and plinking, motherfuckers. Ah, 
That was fun. I have some TEDx talk info for you. Uh, the title of my uh, TEDx talk is, is going to be, Why Should We Still Trust Traditional Authority? And uh, give my talk at the Croc Center Theater here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho on January 12th. I'll be performing in the 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. session. Probably hit the stage around 9.45 a.m. Sorry it is so early, but the 12th is also Kyler's 13th birthday. We tried to move things around as best we could. We got other kids' schedules to consider. And then my daughter's birthdays are on the same time because her birthday's on the 9th. Like, yeah. So, uh, you know, I... I the morning is what I had available. So apologies for any inconveniences that causes. Uh, you can get 25% off your ticket price when you use the discount code SPEAKER when you buy a TEDx ticket through the website www.tedxcda.com. I guess you don't need the W's anymore. Just do tedxcda.com. Link in the episode description. Uh, thanks to Space Lizard Patriot, uh, Patronage on Patreon. Patreon Patronage! That's a little bit of a tongue twister for me. We are donating $1,400 this month to the Pew Research Center. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, the Pew Research Center is a nonpartisan fact tank that informs the public about the issues, attitudes, and trends shaping our world. They conduct public opinion polling, demographic uh, research, content analysis, and other data-driven social science research. They do not take policy positions. And I've used their fantastic statistics in numerous sucks. And they rely on donations to survive. If you would like to donate to this organization, go to uh, www, even if, even if I don't think you need that anymore, uh, .journalism.org. Probably just do journalism.org. I should probably get with the times. Uh, or you can just click on the link in the episode description. Um, but thanks for letting us do that, Space Lizards, who are listening. Uh, thanks so much for all the reviews as well. I checked in recently on iTunes and ratings and... Uh, and the reviews you, you leave there, and, and of course other places, just continually remind me to, to give this my all uh, because I can tell that so many of you appreciate it so much. So thank you for that. Thanks for, thanks for giving me some purpose in my workplace life. Uh, the Happy Murder Tour, about to start. Uh, check DanCummins.tv to see uh, so many 2019 dates all over the place. This month, the Comedy Connection in Providence, Rhode Island. Kicking things off in Providence, Rhode Island, one night only, Wednesday, January 16th. Then Connecticut, the Stress Factory, the Stress Factory in Bridgeport, Thursday, January 17th to Saturday, January 19th. On to upstate New York for, for one night, going to the Funny Bone in Albany, uh, Sunday, January 20th. Then New Jersey, the New Brunswick, New Jersey Stress Factory, Thursday, January 24th through Saturday, January 26th. Uh, then Madison, Wisconsin, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Salt Lake City, Utah, and more coming up in February. Fun, fun and fun. Uh, and now time for some mystery fun. All right, now now that I got uh, some fun announcements out of the way, let's get into the meat of this suck, you meat sacks. Let's, uh, let's suck off some D.B. Cooper. D.B. Cooper successfully hijacked a plane. Uh, since the majority of my traveling has taken place in the our post 9-11 world, we got beefed up airport security. Uh, that seems impossible to me. Like how? Did he do it? Uh, and I know it's fucked up. I know it's a crime. It's a serious crime. And it certainly would be no fun to be on a plane that gets hijacked and legitimately worry that your life will be over soon. But also, however, moreover, uh, kind of like pulling off a bank heist, kind of fucking cool to successfully get the FBI to give you a lot of money. Why? Because of the skill involved. Any, any petty theft, like, uh, you know, I feel like any old asshole can get a hold of a gun, you know, put on a ski mask, you know, walk into a convenience store, tell the cashier to open the cash register, hold up anyone or any place does take a certain amount of, I don't give a fuck for sure, takes a willingness to risk a long period of incarceration if you can't pull it off, but crimes of brute force primarily just require a brutal person. They don't require a smart person. They don't require some uh, someone to have very much intellectual talent. No careful planning is necessary, no finesse. Hijacking a plane and not hurting anyone, getting the FBI to give you over a million dollars in today's value, today's money, uh, and getting away with it? I'd be lying if I said I didn't find that extremely, in a way, impressive. Uh, but maybe, maybe that's not the typical response, that type of behavior. Uh, to be fair, I am the guy uh, who, when I was a, was a kid, young man, watched, when I would watch a movie where someone would you know, rob a bank, for example, I would immediately lose focus on what was going to happen for the next like 15 minutes of the movie because I had gone to daydream land where I was robbing oh so many banks. Uh, robbed a lot of banks in my head. I continued, uh, uh, you know, I don't think I've done it in the last last few months that I can remember. 
but I've had that fantasy a lot in my life, you know? You know, you rob a bank, you, you get all the money, you move down to South America or Southeast Asia, you know, you live on a beach with a bevy of beautiful girls, strong tropical drinks, a lot of room service, sleeping in, recreational drug use. It's a fun fantasy. It's a very, very fun fantasy. Hail Lucifina. Well, as unthinkable as it may be to hijack a plane, at least a U.S. plane in the post-9-11 skies. Now, I found out uh, through the course of research this week that it used to be very common. Seriously. According, according to the Aviation uh, Safety Network, over 1,000 flights have been hijacked since 1931 when they began tracking this statistic. Commercial flights uh, actually began way back in 1914. Short, rickety, terrible flights, but flights where you could buy a ticket. Uh, the era of mass transit via airlines didn't take off, uh, pun not intended, but punny word uh, play also not changed, until the 1950s. There have been flights around the world that have been hijacked since 9-11 uh, for sure, but not many. Uh, there have been some. Just this past April, <laughs> an Air China flight bound for Beijing made an unscheduled landing in the central Chinese city of Zhengzhou, or Zhengzhou uh, when a passenger threatened a flight attendant with a fountain pen. For real, dude used a pen. Uh, it was not a very successful hijacking, but I feel like it still kind of counts. A male passenger on Air China Flight 1350 attempted to use a pen to hold a flight attendant under duress. Luckily, no one was harmed, uh, which makes sense since it was, you know, a pen and not a gun or a knife. Chinese police said the 41-year-old passenger had a history of mental illness. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. Uh, I don't think anyone of sound mind tries to hijack a commercial flight with a fucking fountain pen. Especially when it's not, you know, it's a, it's, it's a fountain pen that hasn't even uh, been modified to double as like a bomb or a gun or, or become like a knife or any kind of effective, effective weapon. Oh man, what would you, how do you, how do you try to hold up a plane with a pen? You will get me my ransom money or I will immediately take out this pen. I will write a series of very scathing letters about how unsatisfied I was with my trip. Oh boy, you just wait. You just wait until I send these letters via the mail, like a psychopath, like a person somehow living in the 1990s still, to various consumer organizations that I am hoping still have employees who read the mail, who read hastily scribbled tirades written by lunatics. You think I'm fucking around? Yeah, I have stamps. I have, I have envelopes. I have paper, motherfuckers! College ruled for easy reading. Oh, sit down and put my seatbelt on. <laughs> nice try. That's not how a pen hijacking works. Now, that is also going to go in my letter. Um, I don't know, I don't know what he was thinking. He clearly probably wasn't, wasn't thinking anything that made sense. Uh, since 9-11, no U.S. flight at all has been successfully hijacked. Not, not with a pen or nothing. Thank you to Air Marshals and TSA. Time suckers. Uh, however, a surprising amount of U.S. flights were hijacked before 9-11. Most well before 2001. I had no idea. You have to go back to 1987 to find an example of an American passenger flight, at least one that either takes off or lands in the U.S., being hijacked. January 11th, 1987, a Continental Airlines DC-9 was hijacked in flight by one Norwood Emanuel. Captain Mark Meyer was credited with thwarting the hijacking by quickly landing at Dulles International Airport outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, Captain Meyer confronted and distracted Emanuel in the rear of the cabin, allowing all 49 passengers and crew to successfully evacuate onto the ramp. Captain Meyer, a.k.a. Captain America, himself escaped two hours later. The FBI eventually talked Emanuel off of the aircraft. No deaths, no injuries. Thank you, Captain Mark Hero Meyer. Uh, prior to that, on January 20th, 1983, Glenn Kurt Tripp, 20 years old, of Arlington, Washington, said he had a bomb in a shoebox. He tried to hijack a jetliner to Afghanistan. He ended up getting shot by one of two Federal Bureau Investigation agents who snuck on board when the plane landed in Portland, Oregon. Thank you, FBI. 4.30 p.m., three hours after Northwest Flight 608 arrived from Seattle with six crew members and 35 passengers, FBI agents climbed onto the cockpit of the plane, uh, or into the cockpit of the plane on a remote runway of Portland International Airport. All 41 people aboard escaped unhurt. No bomb was found. And, uh, and then, you know, Kurt was convicted of extortion and kidnapping in a July 11th, 1980, um, or for, you know, for this crime. Uh, pr prior to this, uh, there's another example. This story is nuts. On December 21st, 1978, 17-year-old Robin Oswald hijacked TWA flight 541 flying from Louisville, Kentucky to Kansas City, Missouri, claiming she had three sticks of dynamite. <laughs> 
The plane landed at Williamson County Regional Airport, uh, now known as Veterans or Airport of Southern Illinois, where she hoped to seek the release of her mom's boyfriend, Garrett Trapnell. Garrett was serving time at Marion Federal Penitentiary for a January 28, 1972 plane hijacking. On May 24, 1978, Robin's mom, Barbara Ann Oswald, she was killed after she also attempted a hijacking. This family, man, so some real winners. Uh, mom hijacked a helicopter in an attempt to fly it into the prison and rescue her imprisoned boyfriend, uh, and she was shot dead. And then her daughter, Robin, eventually surrendered at the Williamson Airport. The dynamite was revealed to be flares, and, and I don't know how much trouble she got in because the state of Illinois uh, didn't release information regarding her conviction or sentencing because of her juvenile status at the time of her crime. Uh, boyfriend, mom, daughter, all three hijacked three different aircrafts. Uh, <laughs> in 1978, all three failed miserably. Boyfriend got sent to prison, mom got shot, daughter got caught. Worst crime family ever. Um, overall, very few hijackings in the 80s or 90s, but during the time in which today's 1971 tale takes place, tons of hijacking. This is what blew me away. There was an epidemic of domestic flight hijackings in America between 1968 and 1972. Over 130 American airplane fl uh, airplanes were hijacked during this five-year time span. There were 40 commercial aircraft hijackings in the U.S. in just 1969. Uh, occasionally, multiple hijackings even occurred on the same day. How was this possible? Well, mostly because airport security did not exist. Gotta say, this episode has made me way more appreciative of TSA agents and security lines. Uh, prior to 1973, airports didn't have metal detectors, and, and, and your carry-on luggage wasn't screened or searched. You could throw whatever you wanted in your bag. Overwhelming odds are no one is going to check it. There was no security. You could just ride up, you know, just walk right up to the boarding gates without even buying a ticket. You'd go to the bar, have a few drinks, hand off a briefcase full of drugs or guns to somebody, uh, just bounce on out the airport. In 1970, you didn't even need ID to get on the plane. How nuts is that? Ticket agents were instructed to give each traveler a once-over looking for behavior that would-be hijackers might display, like lack of eye contact, inadequate concern about their luggage, uh, but then, starting January 5th, 1973, the FAA put mandatory screenings in place for all airplane passengers. They started hiring outside contractors to do that. Why? Because in late 1972, the government realized that planes could be used as weapons. Uh, and they realized this when, on November 10th, 1972, three hijackers threatened to crash Southern Airways Flight 49 into a nuclear research reactor near Knoxville, Tennessee, if they didn't receive $2 million. The airline came up with the money, but the flight continued with a few stops and delays all the way to Havana, Cuba, where the hijackers were then caught and put in jail. Uh, another random piece of trivia, hijacking flights and taking them to Cuba, super common around this time. Uh, you couldn't buy a flight to Cuba because of the U.S. cutting off diplomatic relations with Cuba after Fidel Castro made it a communist, uh, communist nation starting in 1959 when he took the country over, him and his cohorts. Uh, if you were some young revolutionary who idealized communism and idealized the Cuban Revolution, how did you get to Cuba? You hijacked a plane in the States. And uh, odds are Cuba was not going to send you back to the U.S. to be jailed because they didn't have an extradition treaty with the U.S. However, sometimes you got thrown in jail down there because Fidel Castro also didn't necessarily want you to come over. Uh, he didn't invite you. Uh, he didn't necessarily want some random American hippie revolutionaries flying into his country, uh, and you could just end up getting getting tossed in the slammer like those 1972 hijackers, which is hilarious to me. That they made it, they got the money, they made it, and instead of like some parade that they probably thought was going to be thrown for them, you know, they just got tossed in jail. You know, we, we did it, Fidel! Ah, viva la revolution! Cuba! 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 Hey, get your hands off me! Why are you grabbing me? Why are you, why are you, why are you, why are you putting, why are you locking me up? Oh, come on! Good guys, I wanted to burn some flags. Talk about how much I hate America. God, come on. I wanted to smoke cigars. I want to ride around in the jungles on motorcycles. And shoot machine guns and make my dad so mad. Uh, so like I said, realizing the, uh, the planes could be used as weapons. You know, the threat of loss of life on board and mass casualties on the ground was, a, was enough to move the FAA and government to act. Now passengers suddenly had to put carry-ons and metal items through an x-ray machine. They had to pass through a metal detector. Checked bags were inspected only for international flights. Uh, you couldn't just easily bring a handgun on your flight now. Oh, man. Uh, but before the 9-11 attacks, you, you could still bring uh, blades up to four inches long aboard a plane. Baseball bats, box cutters, darts, 
knitting needles, scissors were still allowed on board. Uh, you can still go into the airport without a ticket. Just a normal, nothing to worry about here kind of guy. Just just a guy with, no, you know, with uh, no ticket and, and a Louisville slugger uh, hoping to take in a little batting practice on his way from uh, D.C. to Denver. Um, you know, if he, if he decides to get a, get a flight. So, yeah, so it's easier to hijack a plane when, when D.C. Cooper, or D.B. Cooper, D.C., uh, put myself in there. When uh, D.B. Cooper did it in 1971, than it is now. Uh, now I'd be afraid of getting tossed in jail for just saying the word hijack at the airport, which I do think is illegal. Uh, although, random story that does relate to this episode, I did once accidentally bring a whole bunch of knives onto a plane. Uh, it was like five years ago. I was working at Gurney Productions in L.A. on some various reality shows, and the guy running the show, my, my buddy Todd Hurwitz, him and some other guys that had worked on a show called Porter Ridge we, we worked on, uh, that was filmed out in Indiana, they, while they were out in Indiana, they just got randomly into knives. Some of the people like on the show were into knives. They got into knives. You know, started off as definitely like just a total joke. And then they be began to kind of like seriously get into knives. Still thought it was funny. Thought it was funny to bring uh, them into the office, like ridiculous big like murder knives. You know, take them out during meetings, kind of taunt people, you know, with it. Maybe stick it on the table if it was an old beat up table. Yeah, it got weird. Uh, so of course I loved it. And I started also bringing in knives. And after a while, uh, I had about five various, you know, big murdery type knives in my laptop bag. And then being the forgetful fuck that I am, uh, completely forgot about them when the knife joke was over. And then after working at the office, uh, one day I just went to nearby LAX, we're only about a mile away, if that even, uh, to fly out to a gig, forgot, had a back, uh, laptop bag full of knives, and remembered that I had all the knives in there as it was sliding down the conveyor belt going into the little uh, screening uh, box where the TSA agents can see inside it with their x-ray vision apparatus. And immediately started panicking inside. I just assumed I would be detained. I would probably uh, end up in prison for some kind of attempted hijacking. Just because I, I, I just imagine how it would look if I tried to explain what the truth was. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay, this is not what it looks like. Listen, I like to joke around. <laughs> Listen, this is totally normal. I like to joke around about murder knives at work. Me and the other guys, we think it's fun to wave knives at each other. The, the bigger, the better. And they're just, they're fun to threaten people with as, as a joking way, as a joking way. And I just started putting more and more knives in my laptop bag as, as one does when they joke at work. And, and I forgot. And that's why I have a bag of knives. Um, why, why are you reading me my rights? Well, somehow the TSA screen agent didn't notice the knives. He was busy joking with another agent, and they just slid right on through the machine. And I felt both Im immensely relieved and also kind of terrified that somebody else could theoretically also just bring a bag of knives into the airport. Uh, but, you know, uh, back in 1971, you could bring a bag of knives into the airport every fucking time you flew. You could fly every week for the whole year, and you, you could be a knife salesman and just carry a carry-on luggage full of knives on every flight. It's so crazy to me. Uh, and yeah, while Cooper is the most famous hijacker of this kind of hijacking era to hijack a plane, there are some ver other very interesting hijacking tales I want to share with you before we get into uh, DB. Uh, not going to spend a lot of time here, but these are, these are very interesting to me. Uh, let's, let's first talk about a uh, tough, tough Italian name, Raffaella. Raffaella Minicello. Raffaella Minicello. I feel like if you throw your arm into it, which you can see if you, if you watch this on YouTube, Rafa. Raffaella, Raffaella Minicello. That really helps with the Italian accent. Raffaella Minicello, uh, a native of Melito, Erbino, Italy, Italy, uh, who had immigrated to Seattle as a teen. Minicello, I'll, I'll stop with the yelling, earned a Purple Heart as a Marine in Vietnam. Upon his return to California's Camp Pendleton in April 1969, he came to believe that his unit's paymaster shorted him 200 bucks in salary. This is where this all starts, this hijacking. It starts with him thinking that he was slighted $200 by his unit paymaster. <laughs> Despite the relative pettiness of the you know disputed sum, the 19-year-old Marine considered himself a victim of a great betrayal. He wasn't going to let this shit slide. So one night in May 1969, uh, Minicello uh, decided to make things right, at least in his mind. He pounded eight cans of beer, specifically eight, as it says, he threw back eight cans of beer, broke into Camp Pendleton, took precisely $200 worth of radios, and wristwatches. If you're not going to give me my money, I'm going to take $200 worth of radios and wristwatches, all right? Even Steven. Well, when the Marine Corps found out what he'd done, everyone agreed that it was fair, and, and that was the end of it. Uh, no, of course not. No, he was court-martialed for burglary. Uh, then in uh, September of 1969, you know, worried about his upcoming court-martial trial, uh, facing the possibility of imprisonment for this crime, 
he decides to flee back to Italy rather than face trial. On Halloween 1969, this crazy, this crazy motherfucker took a bag, as one could do back then, took a bag containing a disassembled M1 rifle, a 30 caliber semi-automatic rifle, 250 rounds of ammunition, took this on a bus to the Los Angeles International Airport where he bought a ticket for TWA Flight 85 to San Francisco and got on board with all these rifle components and all, and all these bullets. Uh, he, he takes two shots at Canadian Club uh, aboard the uh, Boeing 707 and he goes into the bathroom in the lavatory where he just brings his bag, you know, as people do in airplanes, not suspicious, and he puts his gun together. He just assembles the, the rifle in the bathroom it pops out, points at a, at a flight attendant, and asks demands uh, to be taken to New York. The plane stops in Denver to, uh, first to get fuel, and uh, uh, Minicello uh, releases the passengers, as, except for the crew. As the jet refuels, he informs the captive crew that New York is not the ultimate destination, but that he's actually trying to get back to Italy, a country that is going to understand why he considered the Marines' $200 slight such a grave affront to his Italian honor. The FBI tries to stop Minicello at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York, uh, where the jet makes, you know, another refueling stop. Agents in bulletproof vests surround the parked plane, hoping either to frighten him into surrendering or to mount a decisive assault. And then Minicello responds by firing his M1 uh, into the roof of the fuselage. The startled agents back off, allow the plane to depart on its long journey to Rome via Bangor, Maine, and Shannon, Ireland. He did it. He actually got this airplane to Rome. Uh, Minicello avoided capture at Rome's airport by taking uh, an officer hostage, stealing the policeman's car. He found brief sanctuary in a rural church where police tracked him down on November 2nd, 1969. Uh, as he was hustled away, he said, countrymen, why are you arresting me? He was sentenced to only 18 months in jail. <laughs> and then he was out in 14 months. He only got 14 months for hijacking a plane uh, with a rifle. And then getting, you know, uh, this plane uh, all the way to Rome. When is this movie coming out? How has this movie not been made? Uh, America wanted to try him and send him to prison, uh, but Italy refused to extradite him. Uh, and then he became a national folk hero in Italy. He was a handsome dude. He became like a heartthrob. Uh, got married, had some kids, still lives in Italy uh, happily, as far as I know, to this day. Uh, how crazy is that shit? Uh, okay, one more interesting hijacking story from this era. And then on to Cooper's story. Uh, June 3rd, 1972, Western Airlines Flight 701 uh, flying from Los Angeles to Seattle is hijacked by four tour of duty Vietnam vet Willie Roger Holder, a man who saw significant combat in Vietnam and a man who was a member of the African-American militant group, the Black Panthers, uh, a group we'll be sucking on next month, by the way. Uh, helping him on this hijacking was his 20-year-old hippie girlfriend, Catherine Marie Kirkow from Coos Bay, Oregon. Holder came up with a plan to try and liberate another Black Panther, Angela Davis, who was on trial for conspiracy to commit murder. Uh, his plan was he wanted to hijack a plane, exchange the passengers for Davis's release and some money, and then take Davis and the money to North Vietnam. He wanted to go to North Vietnam because he felt guilty about what he'd done uh, in the war, what he'd done as the North Vietnamese. He disagreed politically with the Vietnam War. He was angry towards America. Uh, we are also sucking the Vietnam War later this year. Very excited for that topic. And then Willie Holder and Catherine, uh, um, they, they do, you know, hijack a plane. Uh, they claim they have a bomb in the briefcase, in a briefcase, you know, just like D.B. Cooper had done. They demand $500,000. After allowing all 97 passengers to get off in San Francisco, they had the crew fly them to Algeria. They fly to Africa, where they're granted political asylum. A number of Black Panther members uh, were living in Algeria. The Algerian government confiscated and returned uh, almost all of the ransom money they'd gotten. They did get the $500,000 to U.S. officials. And, and then uh, they, got, they got away with it for three years. Algeria also did not extradite uh, people to the U.S. at that time. Uh, but then on January 25th, 1975, the two hijackers carrying fake passports were arrested on illegal entry into France by French police. On April 15th, 1975, a French court refused a U.S. extradition request for the pair on grounds that the hijacking was a political act. In July 1986, uh, French authorities moved to deport Holder to the U.S. after he completed a, a sentence for a completely separate crime for 1984 assault charges in France. Uh, I found some L.A. Times articles from the late 80s stating that he was scheduled to be tried for the initial hijacking, but, but I couldn't find any information about a conviction or sentencing. Uh, his old girlfriend, Kirkow, went missing in France in, uh, in you know, the early, early I guess, uh, right, I'm sorry, late 70s, was never extradited, and her whereabouts and status remain unknown to this day. 
And to this day, she remains on the U.S. most wanted list for domestic terrorism. So she's, you know, in all likelihood out there living, living somewhere. Uh, so they both got away with it for a while. Catherine probably will never get caught. Uh, uh, but they but they didn't get to keep the money. Uh, Raf Raffaella Minicello, you know, didn't get any money. And while he became a folk hero, he did go to jail. D.B. Cooper may have, uh, if he did in fact live, get to, he may have gotten to keep the money. And he definitely avoided jail time, at least for that crime. Uh, okay, so 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 now we we all know more about the history of air hijackings. Let's dig into arguably the most famous story about a non-terrorist airline uh, hijacking of all time. I don't know why today's words are especially tough for me. Uh, time for today's DB Cooper Time Suck timeline. Right after today's sponsor, Time Suck is brought to you today by the Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is an online streaming service. We love them here, at Time Suck. Uh, that gives in-depth information on a huge variety of different topics. Learn about virtually anything you're interested in with thousands of lectures to explore across history, human behavior, science, travel, cooking, and more. All the information is reliable, fact-based, and presented in a truly engaging way. The Great Courses Plus gives you the opportunity to learn from experts who are not only knowledgeable, but incredibly passionate about their subjects. I'm looking forward to checking out their new series on astrophysics because I don't understand astrophysics, but I want to. I want Princeton professor Joshua N. Wynn, PhD in physics, to teach me how space works. How is astrophysics different than astronomy? How is astronomy different than astrology? Do tarot cards have anything to do with black holes? Do black holes have anything to do with Soundgarden? I have a lot of learning to do. So watch or listen to The Great Courses Plus uh, uh, you know, on your schedule. Access courses easily at any time from anywhere with the app. The Great Courses Plus will enrich your life. And as a time sucker, you can sample it for free with unlimited access to learn about anything. Start your free trial now only at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash timesuck. Link in the episode description or link to the deal from the sponsor section of the Time Suck app with just a push of a button. Now time to hit that timeline button. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. We start today's timeline, uh, you know, where the episode began. November uh, 24th, 1971, 2.50 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, there are no tales of D.B. Cooper's childhood or life leading up to the hijacking uh, to dive into because, you know, because we don't know for sure who D.B. Cooper was. You know, that's that's obviously why this is a uh, why this is a mystery. Who was this DB Pooper Cooper? Uh, I had to verify that date, so I had to scroll up my notes for a second. It didn't sound right for me. Somehow, November twenty fourth, just uh, I was like, no, wasn't it November twenty first? No, 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 it was in fact November twenty fourth. Uh, there, are, yeah. So, um, you know, we don't even know if DB Cooper was his real name. More on possible suspects of who the real D Cooper may be after the timeline. Uh, so quick recap of, you know, how the show started. And someone calling themselves, you know, Dan Cooper, a.k.a. D.B. Cooper, uh, shows up at the Portland, Oregon airport in a business suit, holding a small paper bag and a briefcase. He pays $20 in cash for a short flight to the Seattle-Tacoma SeaTac airport. The flight departs on time at 2.50 p.m. Shortly after takeoff, he gets the attention of flight attendant Florence Schaefner, hands her a note just after 3 p.m., informing her that he has a bomb. When she doesn't read it, he quietly calmly tells her, you better read that, I have a bomb. Uh, after getting her attention, uh, probably the best and worst way to get a flight attendant's attention is to tell them you have a bomb. Um, only way you could probably make it worse is by adding more details like, and I will blow us all to hell. Uh, after getting her attention, Cooper indicates towards the soft leather briefcase he's kept on his lap. He puts it back on the sunglasses he's just taken off. Florence walks away, takes a note out, reads it. After a few moments, she approaches another one of the flight attendants, um, Tina Mucklow. And a moment later, the two women walk into the cockpit where Captain William E. Scott reads the note. Captain Scott then immediately contacts uh, Seattle Tacoma Air Traffic Control, setting off a chain reaction of alerts to the C uh, Seattle Police and to the FBI. FBI agent Gary Tallis, a Northern California native, in his first office assignment was among the Bureau men alerted. He was just out of the academy. He was immediately dispatched straight to Northwest Airlines SeaTac headquarters where he introduces himself. Supervisors at the FBI office in Seattle told Talis to stay put, wait for reinforcements who would arrive shortly. Other agents, meanwhile, had contacted Northwest Airlines President Donald Nyrop about the hijackers' demands. 
The aviation executive told the agents in no uncertain terms that if the hijacker wanted $200,000 and four parachutes, or excuse me, two parachutes in exchange for the safe release of the passengers and many of the flight crew, he would get Northwest complete cooperation. And then he said, JK, uh, let him blow those fuckers up. What do I care? Uh, why are you bothering me with this bullshit? We have insurance. Uh, I'm not on the plane, so they can all suck my seven-figure annual salary dick. And then he hung up the phone, and he went back to cheating on his wife with his new secretary. Uh, no, he didn't say JK or doing that last stuff. He, he did tell the FBI to give Cooper the money. Nairob had no interest in risking one of his planes exploding. Meanwhile, back on the plane, Captain uh, Scott sent flight attendant Florence Schaefer back to Cooper, who had taken a seat by the rear window. Schaefer sat carefully beside him in the aisle seat. Cooper showed her the contents of his briefcase, which was actually technically in a uh, attache et, et, uh, et case. Uh, it's a word I don't like to say. That basically just means briefcase, so I'm going to call it briefcase. Uh, Schaefer saw wires, a large battery, several red cylinders that looked an awful like uh, a lot like dynamite uh, in Pooper Cooper's briefcase. I am the only one who calls him Pooper Cooper, by the way, that I know of, and only because it rhymes and because it makes me smile. So please don't, please don't read into that. Please don't uh, go around telling people that you love the Pooper Cooper story unless you want people to think you're an idiot. Uh, or that I'm an idiot for telling you, know, you that his, he was called Pooper Cooper. Uh, Cooper, not Pooper Cooper, told Schaefner. Tell your pilot to stay in the air until they've got the money and shoots ready in Seattle. Uh, Cooper knew that it would take a little, little bit of time to assemble all the money he wanted in $20 bills, especially because he had uh, stipulated in his note that the bills had to have random excuse me, random serial numbers instead of being sequential. The FBI honored that request, but did manage to have all the serial numbers begin with the letter L, signifying that the bills had been issued through the Federal Reserve Bank's San Francisco office. Also, nearly every bill was dated to 1969. Uh, the money was the easy item for the FBI to get a hold of. The harder item was the parachutes that Cooper had requested. When he, told the, uh, when he was told that the parachutes were coming from a court Air Force base in Tacoma, Washington, Cooper turned them down because military chutes open automatically. Uh, using flight attendant Schaefer, uh, Schaefer as his go-between, Cooper explained that he needed civilian parachutes that were equipped with user-controlled rip cords. Uh, these chutes would allow him to decide when to deploy his chute. Frantic phone calls ensued to find the chutes he wanted. Finally, the Seattle police got the uh, owner of a local skydiving school on the line and persuaded him to help. So now the parachute crisis is averted. Uh, investigators were initially confused by why he wanted two parachute sets instead of one. You know, was he going to insist that one of the flight attendants or one of the crew members go with him? Uh, Cooper, we, we now know, never intended to bring anyone with him. His request for two shoots speaks to his criminal genius and thorough preparation in this case. Uh, ask for one parachute and there's a chance that the FBI sabotages it so you can't escape with the money. Right, it makes it so it doesn't work. A chance they could they could take you out without ever firing a shot. Um, ask for two parachutes, and now it looks like you you may take a hostage with you. And you know now you know that the FBI is not willing to risk their life, so you know that both parachutes for sure work. I uh, I would have never thought of that. Once the FBI had the chutes and the money. Uh, word was passed back to Flight 305, which was now in a holding pattern above SeaTac. Cooper was informed that upon landing, he would be given the ransom of $200,000, equivalent to $1.2 million, uh, roughly in today's money. He'd be given 21 pounds of $20 bills in exchange for the safe release of the passengers. He was also assured two sets of parachutes, meaning two backpacks and two emergency backup chest packs. While all of this is going on, while flight attendants, the passengers, and the pilots, the airline executives, and law enforcement are internally freaking the fuck out at the possibility of an airline uh, explosion, witnesses would report later that D.B. Cooper stayed completely calm. He seemed totally relaxed, uh, like he was James Bond or some shit. He just, you know, chain smoked, just Raleigh cigarettes, sipped a bourbon in seven. Uh, Florence Schaefer and the other flight attendants said Cooper was uh, also especially polite, respectful, and courteous. Despite the surreal circumstances, Cooper offered to pay flight attendant Tina Mucklow for his drink. That's weird. He's hijacking a plane for $200,000, but he's still willing to pay for his drink. Uh, curious, you know? What, what, like, was he worried that, that if he didn't, the crew would have to pay for it? Did he not want to get Tina or, or Florence or anybody in trouble? Was he generally not a criminal? Uh, did he just have some beef specifically, you know, with the airline? Uh, Tina Mucklow later disagreed with descriptions of Cooper disseminated by the FBI, which called him a foul-mouthed drunk. Uh, drunk. Uh, she said he seemed rather nice, seemed thoughtful. She later reported that Cooper had even insisted that dinner be brought on board for the crew members he had kept on the plane with him after landing uh, at Seattle or at SeaTac. 
Uh, word came from the ground at roughly 3.50 p.m. that all of Cooper's commands had been met. The landing was only a half hour late, which is uh, really impressive to me. Like, this is all happening so fast. The flight time between Portland and Seattle, the in-air portion of the trip, not counting taxiing out to and from the gates, you know, is, is only a little over a half an hour, right around 34 minutes, depending on how much wind, you know, and how much fuel the pilot decides to, to burn up if they want to really kind of floor it. And, and, and you don't get a drink service the second you're up in the air. Uh, you don't get a, any service at all, in my experience, generally until you've climbed above 10,000 feet. So this is, has all happened within an hour. Like he gives the note to Florence Schaefner probably 10 or so minutes into the flight. You know, 3, 3.05, she gives it to the pilot, he radios it in. The FBI couldn't have even known what was going on until at least, you know, 15 minutes after takeoff. So within 45 minutes, they get all this shit together. Uh, that's impressive. Cooper told the captain to taxi the jet to a brightly lit location when they landed far uh, out on the tarmac, and he stipulated that only one person bring out the money in parachutes. When the lone Northwest Airlines employee stopped the vehicle not far from the 727, Cooper directed Stu uh, flight attendant Mucklow to lower the aft stairs. He then watched closely as she met the employee at the bottom to take the parachutes and then the cash stored in the bank bag. And then at 5.30 p.m., according to FBI transcripts taken from flight crew testimony, Cooper opened the delivered money bag, making sure there was no funny stuff. Less than two and a half hours after handing Florence Schaefer's note, roughly the time it takes to watch a movie, Cooper now has a bag of $200,000 in cash. Both Mucklow and Schaefer reported that he, quote, jumped up and down with joy. <laughs> Childlike after realizing he got the money. Oh, I bet he did, you know. I got $200,000! I got $200,000! Money, 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 money! Money! They need to make a D.B. Cooper movie. Uh, I was thinking maybe start like Bradley Cooper as D.B. Cooper. All right, that scene would be so great. You know, when he gets that money, and he's so excited, looks and it just hits him. They just cut to a quick montage of what's going on in his head. You know, just, you know, he's running up and down the aisles, just throwing money, ha <laughs> ha, throwing money around him. You know, cuts, cuts, quick cuts to like a, a cockpit orgy with the flight attendants, you know. Uh, then cut to everyone just cheering for him and clapping as he stands with each arm around a flight attendant in first class. You know, everybody's, you did it! You really did it! For he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, for he's a jolly good fellow, nobody can deny. And then just snaps back to the reality of him just quickly jumping up and down like a, like a happy kid. Uh, one movie was made, a huge box office flop, actually starring Robert Duvall, who I love. I love Robert Duvall. And uh, Treat Williams as D.B. Cooper. Haven't seen it. Came out in 1981. Uh, yeah, just uh, just didn't do well. Made, made $3.7 million on a, on a $12 million budget. After checking on the money, Cooper then lifted the sack to test the weight. Made sure it felt like, you know, a little over 20 pounds. Uh, he even had Schaefer hold it back so, he could feel, so she could feel the weight. Uh, Mucklow then joked with Cooper about it being a lot of money. And uh, jokingly asked if she could have some. And then Cooper immediately just reached into the bag and gave her a bundle. Uh, Mucklow told him she was just kidding and handed the bundle back saying that she could not accept uh, what she called gratuities. Uh, what a strange detail. Like, who is this guy? Like, he clearly doesn't need all of the money if he's willing to give a bundle of it just to, you know, who's technically a hostage just because she asks. Strange rapport he has with the hostages. He doesn't seem like a mean-spirited person. You know, why did he do this? Just, just to see if he could do it? Is he, does he just hate somebody at Northwest Airlines? Very strange. All of this is so strange. In return for having his demands met, Cooper let all uh, of his fellow passengers leave the airplane, along with two of the flight attendants, Florence Schaefer and another woman named Alice Hancock. Hancock turned back when she realized she'd forgotten her purse, sheepishly asked Cooper if she could retrieve it. Sure, he said. I'm not going to buy you. Hancock noticed he was already in the process of putting on one of his chutes. Uh, Mucklow added he refused the parachute instructions that I handed him, saying, I don't need those. He opened one, looked inside, then closed it up before putting it on. And then he put it on easily, as if he had done this before. Just as cool as a cucumber. No big whoops. Or no big whoop As Reverend Dr. Joe motherfucking Paisley would say. He's a, big, he's a whoop guy. He's a whoop guy, not a, not a whoops guy. Uh, like Lindsay myself. <laughs> D.B. Cooper, just, you know, calmly making a couple hundred thousand dollars in an easy afternoon's work. Uh, Cooper kept the remaining flight attendant, Tina Mucklow, on board, as well as Captain William Scott, First Officer William uh, Ratazic, uh, flight, en flight Engineer H.E. Anderson. You have a grudge against Northwest? Mucklow asked at one point. I don't have a grudge against your airline, miss, is what D.B. Cooper said. Uh, and then, with the, then his final answer, I guess, became famous. 
Uh, he said, I just have a grudge. I just have a grudge. What does that mean? Against whom? Someone who works at the airline? Someone uh, in the government? Someone in his personal life he just needs to prove something to? Uh, Captain Scott told Cooper that an FAA executive had asked permission to come on board the plane and explain to Cooper the penalty for air piracy. <laughs> uh, tell him to forget it, said Cooper. That, that would be super weird if this is where the story ended. You know, like if Cooper was like, whoa, wait, 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 what? What? You're, you're saying that air piracy is a felony? Are you serious? I didn't even, I didn't even realize it was illegal to tell the FBI they were going to blow up a plane unless they gave you $200,000. O-M-G. S-M-H. F-M-L. Ah. Just tell them I'll turn myself in. Tell them I'm sorry. This has all been this has been one giant misunderstanding. If I if someone would have told me yesterday, I was, I was just fooling around having fun. <laughs> Yolo. Uh, Cooper then set himself to the task of figuring out how to operate the aft stairway. He initially uh, insisted the stairway be left down upon takeoff so he could walk down to jump off later. But then the crew made him realize that a metal stairway scraping and sparking under a fully fueled airliner was a real bad idea. So he told the crew, "That's all right." The captain can do it after we take off, um, which FBI agents, you know, uh, later, which kind of revealed, I guess, excuse me, to FBI agents uh, investigating this later that, that he probably wasn't that familiar with the plane he was on because that wasn't possible. The, the cockpit had a stair warning light, but not a lowering button. It was, you know, the, the, the captain could not actually just push a button and, uh, and take this stairway down later. Using what was normally the jet cabin's phone, the hijacker then told the cockpit crew precisely what he wanted them to do next. He said that the altitude had to be, uh, you know, held to 10,000 feet or less. The wing flaps needed to be set to 15 degrees, and the airspeed must not exceed 150 knots, aka 200 miles an hour. Uh, with the wheels, with the wheels left down and the cabin pressure off, that way he would not be shot into the night like a bullet when the stairs were lowered. And Captain Scott Cooper said, I'm wearing a wrist altimeter, so I'll know what your altitude is. So this showed that while he wasn't totally familiar with his exact model of plane, he was familiar with what he needed to do to successfully jump out of it. Uh, he was either an experienced jumper, possibly a former paratrooper, or someone who at least had really done their homework on how this all works. After giving his instructions, he instructed the crew to remain in the cockpit for the entire flight. His flight instructions regarding wing flap, angle, altitude, and cabin pressure made co-pilot, Ritazic, uh, think Cooper... Uh, probably had some type of military background, as he re recently revealed to Mountain News publisher Bruce Smith, when he told me to set the wing flaps at 15 degrees, I knew he was a smart guy. His knowledge of the exact parachuting dynamics of the 727 were uncanny because in 1971 it was classified information, known only to select Boeing officials and uh, select you know uh, um, military personnel working covert operations in Vietnam. The Skyjacker next told the crew he didn't care which route they took south as long as they ended up in Mexico. Mexico was 2,200 miles away, but Flight 305 uh, wasn't going to be able to exceed 1,000 miles. You know, with its fuel, so considering this, Cooper decided that they would stop for fuel in Reno, Nevada. The pilots and airline, or airline flight operations wanted to take their special passenger out over the Pacific Ocean, but the FAA in Sacramento, California did not approve this risky low and slow plan. So the jet was assigned another route. Uh, a route down the popular Victor 23, an eight-mile wide forestry corridor west of the most dangerous mountain peaks, which would send the air airliner above downtown Portland. Some Cooper experts think this was all part of Cooper's plan. They think he knew, based on the flight route, uh, you know, where he would have to end up flying, that he knew Flight 305 would be flying over predictable terrain that he had planned all along to jump down into. At 7.36 p.m., after two hours on the ground in Seattle, Flight 305 rose into the air once more, less than five hours after the hijacking began. Aloft, Cooper ordered flight attendant Tina Mucklow to join the rest of the crew members inside the cockpit. Before she closed the curtains and divided first class from coach, she caught a glimpse of Cooper working intently, tying the lassoed bank bag to his waist. Then, while adjusting a parachute, he waved goodbye to Tina. Former FBI agent and author Richard Tosa uh, told the London Sunday Telegraph he had pressed Mucklow for details about that last moment, and Tina said he put the chute on as if he'd done it every day. Mucklow knew the cockpit door did not have a peephole, and not even the most advanced jetliners back then boasted remote cameras or video monitors. There would be absolutely no way to keep an eye on D.B. Cooper now that the crew was in the cockpit. At 7.42 p.m., uh, Mucklow pulled the door closed behind her, 
the very last thing she saw was uh, Cooper dump some uh, money into an empty chute container. Then he began cutting cords from the chute, tying it around his weight. Okay, so this is kind of a recap of what we just said. And then, uh, so she, she watched him get ready to jump. And then shortly after 8 p.m., a red light came on at a rarely used corner of Flight Engineer Anderson's instrument panel. Beside it were the ominous words, open door. Uh, everyone in the crew knew this meant that the aft stairs had now been let down. So he figured out how to get the stairs down in the back. Cooper had uh, been able to lower them by himself. Scott clicked on the intercom, is there anything we can do for you? And then Cooper answered that everything was, quote, okay. And, and that was the last the crew would ever hear from D.B. Cooper. At 8.13 p.m., the crew felt a slight dip in the elevation of the jet's nose, a quote-unquote pressure bump, closely followed by a corrective adjustment in the tail, a phenomenon they felt indicated Cooper had just jumped. Captain Scott took note of precisely where they were, very nearly over the Lewis River, some 25 miles north of Portland. The crew members exchanged looks. The question hanging in the air was so obvious, it didn't need to be asked. Uh, we keep going to Reno no matter what, said Scott. There was no way for them to know if their suspicions were correct without doing what the hijacker had warned against, leaving the cockpit. Two hours later, at 10.15 p.m., Flight 305 landed at Reno Airport. There was a shower of sparks, you know, flying up from the dangling stairway, you know, scraping along the runway underneath the plane. Uh, then the plane sat idle as the crew waited nervously and minutes ticked by. Finally, Scott turned on the intercom, asked if anyone could hear him. He tried a second time. Since he got no response, he carefully opened the cockpit door. The passenger cabin stretched out before him, empty of life, the air chilly due to the yawning, wide open rear exit. Cooper was gone. He'd probably been gone for two hours. He plunged into the night air. The temperature was estimated to have been 22 degrees that night with winds gusting, icy rain hitting Cooper in his face. Uh, then there were spiked treetops and jagged mountain cliffs waiting to greet him below. It would be a death plunge for most people. And many think that's exactly what happened, that Cooper died that night. But that's pure speculation. A body has never been found, nor strong evidence of his death. Also, within hours, Washington State residents near Cooper's suspected jump zone reported hearing someone who was very much alive. Someone taking off in a small, sputtering plane. Was it Cooper? Could D.B. Cooper have been talented enough to jump into an area where a small plane was waiting for him so he could pilot himself away? Maybe. There's so much we don't know. Former Reno Evening Gazette photographer Marilyn Newton was at the airport in Reno when Flight 305 landed. Her pictures of the parked airliner, the very, very tired crew, and a police canine dog sniffing the aft ramp steps were immediately picked up by World Wire Services. Uh, soon there were two dozen press members at the Reno airport waiting for a press conference. FBI agents interviewed the crew until 2 a.m. and then a quick press conference was held. The crew didn't report anything significant that you don't already know. Uh, they mostly just spoke about how calm Cooper was throughout the entire hijacking. When Cooper jumped the night of November 24, 1971, he didn't just capture $200,000. He captured the imagination of the American public. Days after the ordeal, sociologist at the University of Washington, Dr. Otto Larson, characterized his first case of parachute piracy as, quote, an awesome feat in the battle of man against the machine. One man overcoming, for the first time being anyway, technology, the corporation, the establishment, the system. Jeffrey Gray, author of the 2011 book Skyjack, The Hunt for D.B. Cooper, has thought a lot about the cultural phenomenon aspect of the Cooper incident. He pointed out how one man with that single leap seemed to alter the nation's moral landscape. Uh, Cooper created a situation where, in almost Robin Hood style, many people found themselves rooting for the bad guy, the hijacker. He had transcended the mundane, everyday existence that people often feel they are trapped in. I get that. Who hasn't, even if it was just for a fleeting moment, daydreamed at some point about finding a bag of money, winning a big, winning a big sum of money, or somehow just getting a bunch of money and starting a new life? That's why most people will gamble or play the lottery. Well, Cooper just didn't buy a lottery ticket. He stole the fucking lottery money. He just took it. Taking what you want in life is usually seen as a tremendously admirable and enviable quality. Go forth and kick ass, take names, dominate. Like we're taught to kick ass in school, kick ass in sports, kick ass at work. Kicking ass is good. However, we're also taught not to break the law. Breaking the law, bad. In this situation, it seems like admiration for Cooper so brazenly and coolly taking what he wanted superseded how he had to break numerous laws in order to do just that. The FBI began their investigation into apprehending Cooper shortly uh, after his flight landed in Reno. He'd taken almost everything he had brought on board with him. His hat, the briefcase bomb, his, his overcoat, which we'll never know if that was a real bomb. You know, he took the briefcase that, that looked like a bomb. Uh, took one, you know, that, uh, a set of parachutes, 
the cash in a bag, of course, also gone. Where, where all that is now is anyone's guess. Left behind were a necktie, a pair of Raleigh filter cigarette butts, a signed gate ticket, all destined for analysis and obsessive expert consideration. If he would have just left those cigarette butts today, DNA analysis might have caught him. You know, there would also be pictures of him taken from various security cameras. Someone would have gotten a pic or a video with a cell phone. You really couldn't do something like that today. Not like he did it. Uh, he also left behind an issue of Pootie and Juju. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. FBI agents found a copy of issue 93 of Pootie and Juju, America's most famous and beloved comic book, that witnesses would later testify to D.B. Cooper reading on the flight. The issue was called Cracker Jack Hijack. In this issue, Pootie finds a very unusual prize in the bottom of a box of Cracker Jacks while on lunch break from Pootie's job at the post office. Specific instructions for how to build a briefcase bomb, use it to hijack an American domestic flight, and then disappear without a trace. That's a great Cracker Jack prize. At first, Pootie had no interest in actually hijacking a flight. But then Pootie remembered how sad Juju had been recently because Juju desperately wanted a, a life-size marble statue of Juju's beloved aunt, Ting Tang, to put in the backyard garden. And that statue was going to cost $200,000. So Pootie decided to take the hijacking idea and park it in the shed, which of course means to consider something and ponder on it a while. The next weekend, Pootie decides to just go for it. Carpe diem. And Pootie heads to the local airport in Dingleland, just south of Yickenville, where Pootie lived with Juju, which was a bit north of Doodletown. Pootie decided to use the alias Tootie, so no one would know Pootie's real name. And then Tootie, a.k.a. Pootie, pulled off the same type of heist that DB would end up pulling off. Pootie then bought the statue for 200 grand, had it placed in the garden while Juju was off running errands, and then when Juju came home and saw it, Juju was pissed. Dang it! Gosh dang it to heck! Pootie grabbed the wrong family picture, and now they had a life-size statue of Juju's Uncle Zoot Scoot instead, which was especially unfortunate because, as you probably know, Uncle Zoot Scoot suffered from a pituitary gland abnormality and grew to be just under 8 feet tall. To be fair, other than the height situation, Zoot Scoot looks a lot like Ting Tang. And then when Pootie tells J Juju how Pootie got the money, Juju reminds Pootie that they could have used that cash to pay off their mortgage instead of buying a huge, ugly garden statue. Pootie just shrugs and says, Too little, too diddle, Juju! Which enrages Juju further, who screams, of course, Put in your lunchbox, Shirley! And then adds, That's my line! Too little, too diddle, Pootie! The end. Been a while. Been a while since we heard from those two strange little creatures. Uh, I missed them. I missed them. Sometimes I wish I could just swing through Yickenville and visit them myself. And of course, Pootie and Juju have nothing to do with D.B. Cooper. Uh, if you're confused, new listener, you should be. That was weird. That was especially weird. Okay, so November 25th, 1971, we're back. The morning after the hijacking, Thanksgiving Day, search parties began to look for Cooper. Uh, they combed the area which Cooper was suspected to have jumped for several weeks. At one point, the Air Force's top-secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane was quietly called in to assist. Uh, we learned about that bad boy back in the Area 51 suck. Why was the fastest plane on Earth dispatched to find a single person who was either dead or, you know, traversing through the forest floor under a blocking canopy of trees? Well, probably because that plane also had what was most likely the world's best surveillance equipment on board. Uh, but I didn't find Cooper. Nope. A uh, thick layer of low clouds did not help the search. There was actually five different attempts at photo reconnaissance. Part of that initial FBI search party, a uh, member was Gary Tallis, that rookie agent who was first on the scene at the airport in Seattle. On Thanksgiving morning, he entered a room with a cross-section of law enforcement personnel, including seasoned FBI agents, other first office agents like himself, uh, and sheriff's deputies. Excuse me, uh, state troopers, police from several jurisdictions. Longtime, highly respected FBI agent Tom Manning delivered the briefing. He showed a map and talked about the route the plane had taken and assigned search tasks. Talos was put into a helicopter because he had modest experience with parachute jumping, which seemed to lend itself to the job of hovering throughout the region, looking towards the ground with the hope of spotting Cooper. Uh, Talos described the area as mountainous, adding, it was really stormy weather, a lot of cloud cover, fog, that kind of thing. And I remember flying through clouds, then coming out, and here's these mountains right here. Talos didn't agree, at least in the beginning, with colleagues who believed that Cooper did not survive the jump. He later said, My first impression was that we would find his chute and we'd find him with a broken leg. I never thought he had a problem leaving the airplane. And, in fact, I volunteered to jump out of a 727. You know, the injury comes when you impact the earth. 
I really never even considered the fact that he could have walked out or had been picked up. The areas we searched did not have roads. Talos was surprised at how sure others seemed to be that Cooper couldn't possibly have survived, uh, at least for a couple weeks. Not so much as a trace of Cooper or his bright yellow and red parachute ever turned up. Rather than conclude that Cooper could have simply hiked to freedom, however, Talos eventually chose to agree in part with the prevailing wisdom at the FBI, which was, wa which was that although they couldn't find his remains, Cooper must have surely been dead. To me, that seems like a very convenient stance to take, right? Just go ahead, hijack a plane, you know, get us to give you the money. Sh fine, sure, go ahead, do it. You won't live to spend that money if you jump out of that plane. You're not gonna, you're not gonna live if you, if you, if you parachute out. I mean, I mean, that's the message you would want the public to hear to discourage more people from hijacking planes. You know, during a time when plane hijackings are already out of control. Uh, when he was interviewed decades later, Talos speculated that Cooper had been injured when he hit the ground, buried the chute probably unable to get out of the wilderness because there was no roads, wound up with, quote, his bones scattered all over the world after scavenging birds and small animals picked his rotting body apart. But a fast-growing faction of, Copper, of Cooper as Robin Hood enthusiasts insisted that the absence of physical evidence negated the so-called splatter theory that had been popularized by the FBI. While FBI agents in Oregon and Washington scoured the ground looking for Cooper, other agents in the Washington, D.C. headquarters uh, spent their Thanksgiving searching the Bureau's crime records if Cooper was dumb enough to use his own name, they wanted to grill every Dan Cooper they could find who had a, fel a felonious past. One of the people they ended up speaking to was a man who was inconveniently named D.B. Cooper, who happened to live in Portland, Oregon. They soon determined he had nothing to do with the hijacking. That'd be a bummer, man. I, li I lived, uh, that'd be an unfortunate name in that situation. I lived down the street from another Dan Cummins right after I graduated college, who apparently loved nothing more than getting credit cards, maxing them out, and then never paying them. And I had his debt collectors uh, harass me for years trying to get his money. Probably worse to have the FBI show up at your door thinking that you hijacked a plane. Although, cooler story to tell, you know. Was the FBI here uh, earlier today looking for you? They sure were, ladies. Uh, a week after the hijacking in early December, four letters all signed D.B. Cooper were mailed to newspapers. The first and fourth envelopes were delivered in Reno, Nevada. A daily in Vancouver, British Columbia received a second, and the third went to a paper in Portland, Oregon. Each of the letters made a point of ridiculing the authorities conducting the search, with three carefully composed from words cut out of uh, papers and magazines and pasted onto a sheet of paper. When the authorities originally examined them, they apparently did not notice a possible hint about the sender and the postmarks. Uh, the Vancouver and Portland envelopes were rubber stamped in these towns, respectively, meaning that the writer very likely had been traveling through those areas when they were mailed. But the first and last envelopes, both sent to Reno from Northern California, were another matter. However, those letters have never led uh, to his capture. Neither did a young boy's 1980 discovery of a rotting package full of $20 bills, uh, $5,800 in all, that matched the ransom money serial numbers. Did DB intentionally leave some of that money to throw people off his uh, trail? Did he accidentally drop some? Uh, or, or, or is the rest rotting out there in the woods somewhere along with the rest of his body? Um, after a few weeks, with nothing found, the search was called off. Leads in the D.B. Cooper hijacker case, including those letters, would be investigated uh, by the FBI and other sleuths for the next 45 years. No one was ever found. The FBI finally closed their investigation into D.B. Cooper just recently on July 8, 2016. However, despite the investigation being officially over, there are several interesting suspects to look at. So let's hop out of this timeline and check them out! Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Alright, so let's start off with the main suspect in the D.B. Pooper Cooper case. Uh, this man, out of the suspects that have been thoroughly examined, is who most seem to believe to be D.B. Cooper. Robert Rackstraw. Robert, or as I like to call him, uh, because it makes me smile. Bobbert. Why doesn't somebody name Robert or, or Bob go by Bobbert? Uh, <laughs> Bobbert was a former Special Forces paratrooper, explosives expert, and pilot slash con man who uh, has lived under about 22 different aliases, uh, who now lives, uh, you know, somewhere around San Diego as a 73-year-old man. Uh, he was limited as a suspect by the FBI in 1979, but... A lot of DB obsessives and investigators still think he's a dude. And I gotta say, they make a compelling case. Uh, Robert Bobbert Wesley, DB Pooper Cooper Rackstraw. 
was born in Ohio in 1943. He grew up in a divorced family who moved to a secluded area of the Santa Cruz Mountains south of San Jose, California when he was a young boy. He was interested like a lot of little boys in airplanes from an early age, built a lot of model airplanes, got way into model airplanes. I did, I did that for a while. Good old super glue. Oh man, worked good, smelled better. I didn't do drugs as a kid, but I did build a lot of model airplanes in rooms with, uh, without open windows, so I kind of did do a lot of drugs as a kid. Uh, old super glue and model airplane paint uh, gets you dizzy and lightheaded quick. Uh, unlike me, little Bobbert got more into planes than I did as he got older. When his family took a trip to Arizona to visit relatives in 1960, 17-year-old Bobbert got to meet his uncle, 48-year-old John Ed Pooper Cooper, a skydiver who would tally more than 2,000 jumps during his lifetime. Bobbert followed him around during the trip, hanging on his every word. All he wanted to do was hear about skydiving. By the end of the journey, Bobbert was hooked. It's impossible to know the full impact of that experience on young Bobbert, but seven years later, he did become a paratrooper. Uh, three years before he became a paratrooper, he also chose to go by the name of Cooper out of respect for his uncle, Ed Cooper. That's an interesting coincidence for sure. Not legally known as Cooper, but went by Cooper. Uh, Bobbert was also uh, allegedly quite a charmer. He got a couple girls pregnant in high school. His sister, Linda Lee, would later say he lied to girls a lot. He would... He wouldn't tell one he was dating another. He didn't seem concerned if he hurt somebody. Others in his family also say he lied a lot, said he became quite the con man. His family couldn't figure out which part of what he said was true and which part was invented half the time. Young Bobbert starts sounding like a textbook sociopath. Sociopath, You know, never bothered by the fact that his constant lies and deceptions hurt other people. His sister would say he had no moral compass. Not, not well liked by the family. Uh, he married Gail Marks, and they would uh, go on to have three kids together. In 1964, 21-year-old Rackstraw joined the California National Guard, excelled at training in advanced military techniques such as halo, high altitude, low opening, parachute jumping. In January 1967, Corporal Robert W. Rackstraw, now in the U.S. Army Reserve, was transferred to Fort Benning, Georgia, where he attended four weeks of infantry jump school, followed by an eight-week class in demolition training in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Rackstraw earned his reserve sergeant stripes and left Fort Bragg to return to his growing California family. On weekdays, he would begin uh, taking microwave engineering classes at Cabrillo College. And on the next uh, 43 weekends, he trained with the U.S. Navy Reserve in scuba underwater, underwater demolition and weapons practice. During this period, he also got himself a second social security number, which is odd. Why would you do that? Unless you were uh, maybe you know leading a second life. Uh, Gail filed for a divorce from Bobbert in 1968, three years before the hijacking. She would claim spousal abuse in a divorce request that was printed in a local paper. She quickly changed her mind, though, and the two remained married for a few more years. On May 9, 1969, Rackstraw, uh, Rackstraw graduated from flight school. He learned how to fly helicopters, and then he left to go fight in Vietnam. He ended up initially working in a maintenance hangar repairing helicopters during the war. Fellow pilot uh, Wayne Olmsted, then 21, said he flew and bunked with Rackstraw in Vietnam. Said he was a fearless, very likable guy, if a little crazy. He always had unauthorized weapons around, like a Browning Army rifle, AK-47s, and grenade launchers. He would also match, uh, make these satchel charges, which is like a dynamite-type charge. He, uh, he soon left working in maintenance and began regularly flying choppers and aerial missions. He learned how to conduct low airspeed, nap-of-the-earth reconnaissance flights, frequently hovering over suspected enemy locations to mark the sites with smoke grenades for helicopter gunships. And then six weeks after getting the chance to conduct these uh, aerial missions, which required a, a high level of security clearance, he was no longer allowed to conduct them. Army investigators researching his background for his security clearance became aware of some troubling behavior he'd exhibited uh, growing up in Santa Cruz County, California. It's unknown exactly what they uncovered. Uh, could have been his authorship of those two teenage pregnancies. Uh, there was an early drunk driving arrest on his record, some, some fake IDs he created, uh, his ex-wife's extreme cruelty claim and public divorce records. Uh, there was a front page jail arson fire he'd committed after getting arrested for drunk driving. Any one of these would have canceled the Department of Defense security application. Despite losing clearance, he didn't stop fighting the war. On March 1st, 1970, a newspaper article stated that Rackstraw was awarded a Distinguished Flying Cross, DFC, the nation's highest aviation award, for uh, taking a high-risk action, presumably a, re presumably a rescue, where he went above and beyond the call of duty. On April 17th, he was uh, again recognized for courage, this time with the Silver Star for exceptionally gallant action during an intense Viet Cong mortar barrage and ground attack on sur uh, surrounded American forces. 
Rackstraw skillfully maneuvered his helicopter into the firebase and quickly competed quickly completed the vital evacuation of several wounded soldiers. Or did he do any of that? Investigators have since stated that old newspaper articles about Bobbert, uh, you know, uh, that he would point to as, as claims of him having done this stuff, appear to be forgeries in the sense that it appears he, he lied to editors back home about his war exploits to get this, uh, this bullshit printed. The work of a con man. Uh, and then he got into more trouble with the military. In 1971, back in the States, Rackstraw's commanding officer became aware that Bobbert was beating his wife, uh, again, insisted that his wife, uh, uh, this, uh, this commanding officer insisted that his wife, Gail, and, and their kids be taken into his own residence where his wife and military guards would personally stand between them and anything Rackstraw might try to do. A report of Bobbert choking his wife apparently triggered a discreet army investigation that would go on for many weeks, during which time Bobbert was stripped of his post at Army a Aviation. Meanwhile, the commander advised Gail uh, in the strongest possible terms to end her marriage and leave him, saying she'd be safest if she were far away from this man. Uh, four months later at Fort Rucker, on the very same day that he was certified for commercial helicopter and fixed wing instruction, Rackstraw got the paperwork for the divorce his, wi his wife had filed for. Then on June 21st, 1971, just five months before the D.B. Cooper hijacking, a flood of other past deceptions caught up with the 27-year-old Rackstraw. It had been discovered that he had never attended either the University of Southern California or San Jose State University, uh, San Jose State University, as he had claimed, let alone uh, graduated from either place. In fact, Rackstraw had not even finished high school. Uh, what's more, it was established that he had lied numerous times about his military rank and exaggerated the number of medals he had earned. Uh, Rackstraw was now a documented con artist. He was compelled to resign in shame from the military career he loved for conduct unbecoming an officer. Official documents reveal he received a general discharge under honorable, as in below honorable conditions, uh, which two county officials years later would characterize in his court records as less than honorable. An army attorney explained that a general discharge is usually given to soldiers who have engaged in minor misconduct or have received non-judicial punishment under Article 15 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The biting words of a testifying army superior read in a Stockton, California courtroom, uh, one, of the, one of the two worst lieutenants I have ever seen. His leaving the army is a great asset to the service. So Rackstraw, now, uh, no doubt now, is infuriated uh, with, with his expulsion. He's very angry. He, he's a man bearing a grudge, as D.B. Cooper would soon claim. The day after getting kicked out, the disgraced army liar immediately stops making payments on his leased car, packs up his belongings, takes off for the Pacific Northwest. Doesn't even bother to let his extended Calif uh, California family know where he's going. Uh, Bobber decides to use his pilot qualifications to get work in Washington State. As he would explain years later, his plan was to start a light plane service for realtors in the Northwest, enabling them to have aerial photography done to show off their prime properties. One might argue uh, that would also be the perfect way for a disgruntled pilot to take a thorough bird's eye look around at the rugged, heavily forested mountains between Portland and Seattle that D.B. Cooper would very soon jump into. It was an opportunity to exhaustively survey some of the harshest terrain found anywhere in the United States, analyze what possibilities might be at hand if someone were to someday perform a daring, dangerous parachute jump directly into that wilderness. Later in 1978, uh, he'd get arrested on charges of murdering his stepfather. The case went to trial, but he was acquitted. In 1979, he faced charges of aircraft theft possession of explosives and check fraud. He spent more than a year in jail and was released in 1980. So we have a guy here who was in the area of the crime when the crime went down, a guy with a documented knowledge of parachuting, like a lot of it, uh, a con man, dedicated, uh, documented con man, uh, you know, lied to the military, a uh, charming ladies man, you know, was also a wife beater, but that charming, charming ladies man kind of thing comes into play with the way he kind of charmed those flight attendants. A guy who admittedly moved to the Northwest, basically just, you know, went off the grid a few months before the hijacking occurred, who planned on doing, you know, aerial surveillance work over the exact area D.B. Cooper jumped into. Uh, a guy with a fascination with explosives, you know, a guy who was familiar with explosives, a guy who had chosen to go by the name of Cooper at one point. You know, his uncle was paratrooper Ed Cooper. So I do see why so many think he could have done it. Also, retired Lieutenant Colonel Ken Overturf, uh, Rackstraw's former Vietnam commander, believes that, uh, you know, that uh, this guy, this Bobbert, uh, had the skills to live through the jump. I don't believe the question of whether Rackstraw was capable of jumping from a 727 is even pertinent, uh, Overturf. 
would say when interviewed about Bobber, he pointed out that jumping from that staircase is much easier than a side door jump. The jumper experiences a lot less turbulence from the rear than from the side. An experienced jumper, or even a really crazy less experienced jumper, would have no issue with going out the back of an aircraft at an airspeed of plus or minus 200 knots. So he thinks it was very possible. Uh, Overturf added that Rackstraw had the intellect and capabilities to determine the best type of parachute and do the necessary calculations to make the jump and arrange for a successful recovery. But for reasons we'll probably never fully know, the FBI does not think that he's the guy. Uh, another Cooper suspect who's gotten, uh, I, I guess, the most recent press is a, is a man named Walter Recca. In 1971, Walter was witnessed hanging out at a bar at the uh, Portland airport the day before the D.B. Cooper hijacking. He was overheard asking a woman if she thought B.D. Stuper was a cool name. When she said no, he said, all right, what about uh, P.P. Snooper? And when she said no again, he said, how about Easy Pooper? And then she got up and walked away. Minutes later, Walter was heard mumbling to himself, should have said D.B. Cooper. And then, sure wish I had $200,000. And then moments after that, he said, I'm going to hijack the fuck out of one of these planes tomorrow. Uh, despite this evidence, the FBI ruled Walter out of being a suspect in 1972. When they asked him point blank if he did it, and he said, will I get in trouble if I say yes? I will. Then no. No, I did not do that. Uh, no, of course that's nonsense. No, just this past spring, an 84-year-old Floridian named Carl Charlie Lauren uh, published a book called Easy Pooper. The True Story of P.P. Snooper, a.k.a. D.B. Cooper. No, that's not the name of it. He released a book that claims to identify the iconic skyjacker D.B. Cooper called D.B. Cooper and Me, a criminal, a spy, my best friend. Um, it traces the alleged exploits of Detroit native Walter R. Pekka Recca. Uh, Lauren says that Recca was a lifelong covert operative for the CIA and other agencies of the intelligence community, possibly even the KGB and Mossad. Red flags. A lot of red flags happening with this suspect. Uh, the old, my buddy was a covert operative for the CIA story. Uh, loved by wackadoodles everywhere because you can't just prove it, you know? Just like you can't just prove like I was a covert operative in the CIA or, you know, or I see aliens all the time. <laughs> you can't prove when someone's saying that kind of stuff that, that it's not true. But in your gut, you know that they're probably full of shit. Uh, I've met a few people who claim to have been top secret badasses, and I've, str I've strongly suspected they were completely full of shit every single time. But who knows? Let's give uh, Recca, you know, a chance, I guess. Lauren's story starts in Michigan during the 1950s, where Lauren and Recca were members of a skydiving team attached to the Michigan Air National Guard. A friendship ensued, which lasted in spurts until, until 2014, when Recca died uh, at 80. Lauren says that his suspicions that his friend Walter was actually D.B. Cooper began the night of the skyjacking. Walter Recca was tough as nails, he said in uh, Principia's, Principia Publishing's book, um, or a book published by Principia Publishing, uh, at this press conference for Principia Books in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in mid-May 2018. Uh, he characterized Recca as being the most skilled and fearless skydiver in the Pacific Northwest, attributes that D.B. Cooper needed to successfully conduct the only skyjacking in the U.S. that has never been solved until now. And he said, I know Walter Recca was D.B. Cooper because... Walter Recca was D.B. Cooper, Lauren proclaimed. That's an exact quote. Uh, that's an interesting way to prove something. That, sound, that sounds like something uh, an 84-year-old would say. Just some grouchy old 84-year-old. How do I know that Walter Recca was D.B. Cooper? <laughs> because he was D.B. Cooper. Because I said so, God damn it. How dare you question me. I was fighting wars long before you were shitting in diapers or sucking on your mama's teeth. Or wet your bunk bed, you little livered candy ass. Now, what was I saying? Walter Recca was D.B. Cooper. Wait, hold on. Who's D.B. Cooper? Don't lecture me. Walter Recca slept with my wife, that son of a bitch. Ought to have him strung up. He was a crouch. He was a Nazi spy. I always suspected he was part colored. His hair was too curly. Peaches and ricotta cheese. That's about all I eat anymore. Now, stop talking to me about this D.B. Cooper fella. I ain't queer, and I ain't tugging on him or any other fella. One time I loved a man. That was a long time ago. Ah, uh, now my feet ache at night. I'll fight you barehanded if you try to talk to me about P.P. P. Cooper again. <sighs> Peanuts give me gas, and I don't handle milk chocolate as well as I used to. Now get off my plane. Cronkite's about to come on television. I won't be late for supper. 
Okay, obviously I mock Lauren a bit for being a little older, but uh, according to a book review, he does mess up most of the uh, details of the skyjacking. Like known details, including the flight path, the types of parachutes used, exit points, behavioral characteristics. So, uh, you know, in his book, he, he doesn't even get the known parts of the story correct. Uh, yet he and his uh, Principia publisher, Vern Jones, cite a slew of bizarre but intriguing pieces of evidence. I'm not, not sure I trust a, a man named Vern any more than I trust a crazy old man. Uh, probably because Vern was the name Ernest P. Worrell, that crazy character from all the Ernest movies back in the 80s and 90s, used to address the audience. Remember that? You know, you know what I mean, Vern? I Vern. I Vern. You know what I mean, Vern? Uh, Lauren and Vern point at an alleged eyewitness account given by Jeff uh, Oshidas. Uh, this name is so fucked up. O-S-I-A-D-A-C-Z. You know what? If you have that last name and you're pissed that I can't pronounce it, no one fucking cares. Everyone has been missed. No one, everyone's hated your name your whole life. What's your name? <laughs> Osa. There's, there's, it's way too, there's too many vowels. There's too many vowels. This looks, I don't know, it's like Czech or something, this name. Osa. I don't care. Jeff. We're going to call him Jeff. Because fuck that last name. Uh, Jeff, a former cop, uh, says that he encountered Rekka the night of the skyjacking walking alongside a mountain road near Clee Ellum, Washington, and then conversed with him in a nearby diner. This is the main evidence that, that uh, Rekka was supposedly D.B. Cooper. Uh, this, this Jeff says that Rekka was soaking wet, wearing a black suit, carrying a bundled up raincoat under his arm. Uh, the diner was nearly empty and Rekka approached Jeff and asked where they were. Jeff informed him that they were four miles east of Cleo, uh, about a hundred miles east of Seattle. And Rekka in turn asked Jeff to call a friend named Don Brennan in Heartline, Washington, another 100 miles further east and give him driving directions. Jeff said that he compiled, uh, that he, sorry, Jeff said that he complied with Rekka's request at that point, Jeff left to perform a guitar gig at a local gr uh, Grange Hall and only rejoined this drama in 2016 when Jones and his investigatory, investigatory team tracked him down through a local newspaper reporter in Clee Allen. Bullshit! Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> the D.B. Cooper hijacking was a big national story. Uh, there were FBI search teams all over South, uh, you know, East or Southwest Washington, and, and I've been to Clee Ellum multiple times. It's right off I-90, just east of Snoqualmie Pass, towards the eastern base of the Cascades. Cooper demanded they fly the plane at a low altitude, so going straight over the Cascades near Clee Ellum would not have made sense at all. Doesn't make any sense geographically. It's too far north, too close to the mountains. It's also nowhere near the flight path that took Flight 305 over, uh, you know, Portland, Oregon. I mean, the crew. Of Flight 305, you know, uh, uh, including the pilot who was flying the fucking plane, thought that Cooper jumped 25 miles north of Portland. Clee Ellum is 94 miles, you know, via flight uh, east of Seattle. Uh, no, I'm sorry, sorry, uh, 95 miles via flight from Portland. Like it, like it's not even close. If you look at a map, it's not even close. You know, you got you got Seattle over there, the Puget Sound, and you know, over east you got Clee. Well, then south you got Portland. It's like the plane would have had to go way east then curved way back west, then it doesn't make any sense. And let's say D.B. Cooper did land near Clee Ellen, for argument's sake. But then who sees a man in a suit, in a business suit, out in the woods, <laughs> soaking wet, walking alongside a rural mountain road, a man the night before Thanksgiving who doesn't even fucking know where he is. And, and, then, and then you don't connect that man to maybe being D.B. Cooper, uh, the guy who's on the front page of the paper, that same, like, like the very next day, until 45 years later, you know who does that? A guy who's full of shit. Get out of here. Apparently, Rekka, before he died in 2014, told Lauren that he bailed from Flight 305 over Clee Ellum. Doesn't make sense. Landed close to the highway where he's spotted by Jeff. He says the FBI and crew has provided uh, misdirection when it comes to the truth of the flight path. Why would, why would they do that? Why would the FBI knowingly send search parties to the wrong part of the country so that they could definitely not find the hijacking suspect? Vern and Lauren just sound like bigger morons by the second, right? Like, no, they would never do that. Uh, we want to lure the suspect into a false sense of security and feel safe. So we put our thinking hats on and we decided to conduct a search party in an area where we knew the search suspect would for sure not be in. <laughs> so you can't out smock a fox, you know, or whatever that thing is. Don't you think that uh, that just about guarantees the suspect will, will never be caught since when crimes aren't solved in the first 48 hours, the odds that they'll ever be solved are, are dramatically reduced? Is the, Oh, shit! Is that true? Man, dang it! 
I forgot about that. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I have a, some lost time to make up for. Uh, yeah, when confronted with several story inconsistencies in an interview, uh, Vern shifted away from hijacking details and then just discussed various deals of Rekka's secretive, interesting past, including his many foreign passports, vaccination certificates, diaries that seemed to validate a career as a spy. Uh, he supposedly had an identity card issued by the KGB. He supposedly had passports issued in Rekka's name by the UK, Soviet Union, and the US, because, you know, you can't possibly forge that stuff. Uh, Rekka also supposedly told Vern that he killed people in all those countries working for various spy agencies. Uh, Rekka also confessed to his niece, Lisa Story, that he had assassinated a Middle Eastern diplomat named Abu Dhab. Uh, he also told her he was never an employee of the CIA or M6, T or M1, uh, M6, M16, whatever, uh, per se, uh, but rather was a freelance contract covert operative, a mercenary for hire. This guy acted like he was like the, like the joke version of Chuck Norris, the biggest badass in history. Get out of here. Uh, Lauren also claimed that he, was, uh, he once took some discarded tissue from one of uh, Walter's trash cans, sent it to an attorney friend to have Rekka's DNA tested, you know, as old friends do, and that the attorney then betrayed his trust and sent the DNA sample to the FBI, and then he says that Rekka contacted him asking why the FBI had reached out to him, asking him about the DNA, DNA sample, uh, asking him if it was his, uh, pressing him with questions about D.B. Cooper, you know, like the FBI does. Like they just call people up and just go, hey, are you D.B. Cooper? Because we've been looking for you. <laughs> I don't do that. And then after this betrayal, uh, this alleged betrayal, Rekka stopped becoming friends with Lauren, but then later randomly reconnected. And then Rekka, for some reason, eventually told Lauren, quote, I can't lie to you anymore, Charlie. I am D.B. Cooper. <laughs> and I think with all that info, we can stop looking at Rekka as a viable D.B. Cooper suspect. Uh, here's what happened. A lying old man wrote a shitty book about another lying old man's stories published by an idiot. Or some similar variation uh, of this equation. However, despite how ludicrous this D.B. Cooper claim is, the book D.B. Cooper and Me, a criminal, a spy, my best friend, has 28 reviews and a four and a half star rating on Amazon. <sighs> and I want to look at those reviews in today's Idiots of the Internet. Idiots of the Internet. David Rochelle gave this stinking heap of investigative horseshit five out of five stars, writing, Book just arrived. Super, super easy read. Hard to put down and extremely well written. Exciting read. Yes, you know instantly, and then all caps, this is the real D.B. Cooper. Plenty of proof, including, and details. What? Plenty of proof, including, and details. Did you mean there are details of proof? Like, like, I like that it doesn't seem as if the details are important to you. Uh, but you're glad that they're in the story. You know, like, guys, this book proves who D.B. Cooper is. And not only does it do that, it also provides details of proof of who D.B. Cooper is. Uh, David continues saying, Explains how the same man committed a small robbery following the exact same modus operandi. Although this time in a restaurant. Offering the young, very frightened waitress a portion of the ransom money for her stress and trouble. He at the time also acted like a gentleman robber, a la James Bond. Then the book explains how the author knew him for years. As part of a group of ex-military paratroopers who from the 1950s developed their own daredevil, even reckless style of parachute jump mini club stating that the only thing bad that happened to them was a few broken bones. LOL, right? Shall I continue? Walt worked for branches of the CIA before and after the hijacking, only post he was subject to a only post he was subject to a form of MK Ultra to ensure loyalty. Well, wow, David, uh, if you listen to this podcast, could you please contact me? For real, please contact me. Uh, hit me up on social media. I want to sell you some stuff. I want to sell you so much stuff. I want to sell you so much overpriced, not what I say it is stuff, because apparently you will believe literally fucking anything someone tells you. You know, so guys, check out Dan Cummins sold me. This is a real piece of the Ark of the Covenant. He sold it to me. He sold me this small piece of wood, which I will admit does look like a like a piece of plywood from Home Depot for only $20,000. 
part of God's magic chest. It has a barcode stapled onto it for some reason, but I don't even care. It was $20,000. How do I know it's real? Ha! <laughs> LOL. Shall I continue? He told me it's real. Uh, David continues. Even if it's later proven he's not DB, this in itself is the most interesting part of the book and why, in my humble opinion, he wanted his story told. Wait, whoa. Wait, what? David, just a few sentences earlier, uh, in all caps, you wrote, you know instantly this is the real D.B. Cooper. And now you're saying, you know what? Maybe not. Maybe not, but who cares? Because it's interesting as hell. You know? It's almost like you don't even you don't even think about what you're writing at all. Uh, David wraps up with something I cannot for the life of me get my head around. I don't know what he's talking about here. He writes, he was a good Polish Catholic. <laughs> Prayed daily, very heavy smoker, drank heavily, extreme excitement rush junkie, super daredevil. Admittedly lousy father, iron worker, fluent in Russian, Polish, and conver conversant in other languages as well. Definitely not stupid. I, I like uh, how, it, how in pointing out why someone is definitely not stupid, you list very heavy smoker, drank heavily, and iron worker. He can't be really stupid. He smokes a lot, drinks quite a bit, and he works with iron. Da -da -da, ta -da! Uh, okay, let's move on. My head hurts a little bit. Not sure if I feel off because of uh, David's nonsense or because I just said the word Polish, which uh, always just, it makes me a little sick. Just po- ugh. It's just Polish, you know? Ugh. Proof that Satan's real. Uh, I Like Amazon also gives this book five stars, saying, This is an amazing documentary written by Carl. So professionally written, I'm amazed, since he is not a professional writer. Uh, you don't read documentaries, you dumb shit. You watch them. You only watch documentaries. <laughs> you read nonfiction books, biographies, mysteries. You watch documentaries. Uh, the evidence here convinces me that Walt is B.D. Cooper. That's what he says next. Walt is B.D. Cooper. Okay, all right, maybe he is B.D. Cooper. But is he D.B. Cooper, the person we're talking about? Uh, I know it's a silly little mistake. But, uh, uh, and then he says, I will, be, I will be interesting to watch over time. <laughs> to see if the evidence will hold up. If you wonder like me, how could the FBI not get this figured out? Just take a look at how the FBI could not figure out Hillary's email crimes. They just did not want to, and they already knew the truth. Great book. Buy it. You get it. I like Amazon. You fucking get it. You know what? You get it. You get life. The FBI doesn't like to figure out things out. They, they don't like figuring things out. Uh, you like, you like uh, reading documentaries. You love books that solve mysteries by presenting nonsensical evidence. You you should meet up with the two reviewers uh, I've already talked about and start some kind of important think tank. Uh, over, bouncing just for a second, over to goodreads.com, Kyler Baldwin reviews this book, giving it four out of five stars and also letting everyone know he loves to write only in simple sentences uh, and he likes, to, he likes to write a lot of them. He writes, D.B. Cooper and me is about how Carl tries to figure out how D.B. Cooper is. Carl writes about all the proof he has of D.B. Cooper being his friend. He tries to get Walter, Carl's friend, to say he is D.B. Cooper. I liked the book because it was interesting to see how Carl and Walter met and see their friendship with others develop. I also liked how much detail there was in the book. There was a lot of accidents almost leading to death, but the guys did not have fears. I did like that it had a lot of detail in the personal lives of main characters, but there was not much detail on the part of the FBI. I wish it had some more things the FBI had to go throw to try and find out who D.B. Cooper was. The book got a little slow in the middle because it was all just about parachuting and what happened during all of those years. The book was a calmer kind of book. There was not any war involved, even though they did serve in wars. Overall, the book was good. It could have been better. Ah, uh, you want five out of five stars from Kyler Carl? You write some books that are less calm, you son of a bitch. That's how you get from good to better. Sick of your calm-ass books. Uh, finally, user James Clark gives the book uh, five stars back on Amazon. Writing excellent, compelling read. Carl Lauren tells a fascinating story. He sure does tell a fascinating story, James. That's exactly what it is. It's a fucking story. It's a made-up, silly story. Now let's get out of here and look at some a uh, few more suspects. Some of which do appear to be more credible. Alright, let's talk about let's talk about Lynn Doyle Cooper. 
2001, a woman named Marla Cooper publicly suggested her late uncle, Lynn Doyle Cooper, or LD, was D.B. Cooper. Her mother, Grace Haley, was LD's sister. She agreed with her daughter's theory and had some interesting evidence to back up some family claims. Uh, I've always had a gut feeling it was LD, Haley told ABC News. I think it was more what I didn't know is... I think it was more what I didn't know is what made me suspicious than what I did know because whenever the topic came up, it immediately got cut off again. Haley says that LD grew up in Sisters, Oregon and was familiar with the area where the hijacker jumped, a fact that is consistent with the FBI's theory that D.B. Cooper knew the Pacific Northwest. He was also a war veteran, which matches the theory that the hijacker had a military background. He was a logger and an outdoorsman, tough enough, Haley believes, to leap out of a plane into the wilderness and survive. And he also showed up to a family Thanksgiving gathering in 1971, the day after the jump, uh, looking quite beat up. Said there had been a car accident. For the purposes of fingerprint testing, Marla Cooper gave the FBI a, a guitar strap that LD left behind, but it was found not conducive to lifting fingerprints. Okay, so this suspect is better than the last one. Last name of Cooper, military experience, knew the area. However, uh, Sisters is 101 miles southeast of Portland by uh, as far as how the crow flies. Uh, but it is... It is along the flight path to Reno, and the crew doesn't know for sure that that little bump they felt was DB jumping. So maybe. Uh, pretty funny if part of his plan was to show up at the family Thanksgiving dinner, like as part of an alibi. You know, I bet, I bet that turkey, taters, gravy tastes extra good if you know you have an extra $200,000 in cash now. Uh, I think almost anything uh, feels better if you have, if you have uh, a lot of cash along with it, a lot of, like an extra pile of, of cash. Like I like, like I like having a couch here in the Stuck Dungeon. We have a couch, but I would like it more if it was made of cash. Like a cash couch, probably not very comfortable to sit in, but far and away the best, the best kind of couch. Uh, then there's Dwayne Weber. The FBI will have you know that Dwayne Weber, who claimed to be Cooper on his deathbed, was ruled out by DNA testing. But in 2000, he was still a promising suspect. According to a CBS News report, in 1995, hospitalized in Florida with kidney disease, Dwayne Weber motioned to his wife to come close. After 17 years of marriage, there was something she needed to know. He says, come here, come closer. Uh, Joe Weber recalled. He says, I have a secret to tell you. I'm Dan Cooper. Since her husband's death in 1995, Joe Weber started to piece together clues over the years. Joe recalled the sleep-talking nightmare Dwayne had about leaving fingerprints on a plane, an old knee injury he claimed he got from jumping out of a plane, the local library book on D.B. Cooper with Dwayne Weber's handwriting in the margins, the item she stumbled across during 17 years of marriage. I can't walk away from it, Joe says now. Why would he have an old Northwest Airline ticket? Why would he take me to a place where some of the money was found? Why all of this? There's too many pieces of the puzzle that fit. Uh, like some of the money was later found. So apparently where they found that little bundle of cash, uh, you know, later, uh, or where they found that little bundle of cash, I guess, I guess they went there before and he had pointed this out to her. Um, so, so maybe he did it, uh, you know, Probably not because of the DNA testing, but, you know, uh, I know it's possible to make mistakes with DNA testing. Uh, there's also the very intriguing possibility of Richard McCoy. This guy looks like a strong candidate to me. Uh, D.B. Cooper's daring escapade inspired copycat crimes. The most high profile was perpetrated by a man who some suspect wasn't a copycat at all. Richard Floyd McCoy Jr., a Vietnam veteran, former Green Beret helicopter pilot, and avid skydiver, uh, who was studying law at Brigham Young University. Here's what we know about this guy. McCoy hijacked a plane in 1972, parachuted to freedom with half a million dollars, but was captured days later, having left behind way more evidence than whoever committed the 1971 heist. Convicted of the 1972 crime, he then busted out of jail in August of 1974. Uh, he used his access to the prison's dental office to fashion a fake handgun out of dental paste. That's mind-blowing. Uh, then he was killed three months later in an FBI shootout in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, although his age, 29 at the time of the Cooper hijack, and the fact that he had an alibi has cast some serious doubts, a 1991 book about his exploits uh, raised his ranking on the Who Was D.B. Cooper matrix. D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, co-authored by an ex-FBI agent named Russell Claim, was published in 1991. The book made the case that Cooper and McCoy were the same person citing similar methods of hijacking and a tie left by Cooper similar to those worn by Brigham Young University students. The author said that McCoy never admitted nor denied he was Cooper, and when McCoy was directly asked about whether he was Cooper, he replied, I don't want to talk to you about it. The agent who killed McCoy is quoted as saying, when I shot Richard McCoy, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time. 
The widow uh, of Richard McCoy, Karen Burns McCoy, did sue and win a settlement from both the book's co-authors and his publisher. I will say the composite drawing of D.B. Cooper, uh, if you've ever done an image search for D.B. Cooper or seen a picture of D.B. Cooper, this is the picture you've seen. There's like this one by far uh, the most known picture. That, that sketch looks a lot like Richard McCoy, like exactly almost. I mean, the alibi was provided by his family, so I don't know. Maybe they lied to protect him. It is possible. Uh, if, if it wasn't Bobbert Rackstraw, I, I vote Richard McCoy. Last suspect, uh, there are others on the web, but they seem less credible than this guy, William Gossett. Described as a quirky guy with a military background and the necessary physical characteristics, college instructor Gossett, who died in 2003, told both of his sons several times he was the hijacker. His son Kirk recalls taking a strange trip to Vancouver, Canada with his father two years after the hijacking, possibly to stash ransom money into a safety deposit box there. Uh, ABC News reported that the FBI was skeptical of William Gossett's claims. There is not one link to the D.B. Cooper case other than the statements Gossett made to someone, said FBI Special Agent Larry Carr, who oversaw the Cooper investigation for years. Uh, Gossett had military experience, including wilderness survival, resembled the FBI composite sketch of Cooper, also, uh, Gossett's eldest son, Greg, said that his father, a compulsive gambler who was always strapped for cash, showed him wads of cash just before Christmas 1971, just weeks after the Cooper hijacking. He speculated that his, uh, his father then gambled the money away in Las Vegas. So, have we solved the D.B. Cooper mystery? No. Uh, but, but uh, you know, now you know what it's all about. What's funny to me is, is that we now know for sure that some of these suspects are seriously full of shit. Best case, one of them is not lying. Uh, you know, uh, the worst case, they're just all lying. What a weird thing to do. To claim to have done something like hijack a plane, make that claim to your family, you know, something like numerous times, when, when you know it never happened. It's so odd and pathetic. Like, that is just not something I would be interested in ever doing. Like, I, I just couldn't keep up the lie. Uh, hey, 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 Kyle Monroe, come here. I need to talk to you about something. I need come here. I need to talk about something. Whew, I've been uh, I've been keeping the secret for a long time, but I want you to know that uh, I am J.K. Rowling's ghostwriter. Yeah, 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 yeah. For no, for real. No, hey, hey, it's, for real, for real. I wrote the Harry Potter books. Uh, I came up with Dumbledore, Harry, uh, Hermione, uh, Dobby, uh, that ugly ginger family. That's all me. Uh, wizards, spiders, unicorns, all that shit. I thought of all that shit. Gollum. Uh, Sauron, uh, the elves, Frodo, you know, uh, hobbits, uh, C-3PO. Uh, she didn't write all that. You know, I, I wrote that. Uh, Dad, Dad, I think you're confusing Lord of the Rings and maybe even some of uh, Star Wars with Harry Potter. You know what, buddy? Hey, you know what the problem is? It's not me, you know, mix I, listen, I've created so many awesome characters that it's hard to remember all of the genius stuff I've done. It's called burden of knowledge. You wouldn't even know a thing about it. So don't, so don't tell your friends. Don't tell your friends that I'm the guy. I am the real author of Harry Potter. I wrote all the orc stuff and everything. Just unless they keep, a, unless they promise to keep it a secret. If they promise to keep it a secret, then tell them. Yeah, you should tell everybody. Uh, you, t tell, you know what? Tell as many people as you want. It's cool as shit. Uh, so strange. Uh, who did it? We'll probably never know. But uh, until they find strong evidence of his death, I I'm just going to kind of think that some crazy son of a bitch pulled it off. Some, uh, somebody actually hijacked a plane. Got $200,000 in 1971, parachuted down, you know, near the western Oregon and Washington border and got away with it. Someone someone who sat down, read, read articles about the FBI, hunting him down, smirking and knowing they'd never catch him a couple days later. Messed up if you really think about it, but also pretty cool in a messed up way. You know, he wasn't a good guy, but he also didn't hurt anybody, didn't even insult anyone. He did get his money. He did jump out into the cold, dark sky. Uh, he did leave us wondering to this day what happened next. Time now. For top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, people used to hijack flights in America all the time. I still think that's so crazy. Between 1968 and 1972, over 130 American airplanes were hijacked in the United States. There were 40 commercial aircraft hijackings in just 1969. Number two, prior to 1973, airports had no security screening and you didn't even need to show ID to get on a plane with a suitcase that would not pass through a metal detector that no one was going to search. Thank you, TSA. Thank you, Air Marshals. Let's please never go back to this old system. 
Number three, on November 24th, 1971, the day before Thanksgiving at 2.50 p.m., someone claiming to be D.B. Cooper hijacked Northwest Airlines Flight 305, departing Portland, Oregon, and headed for SeaTac Airport between Seattle and Tacoma. By around 8 p.m., he was jumping into the sky with $200,000 in cash and parachuting somewhere over either Washington or Oregon, and he's never been definitively found since. Number four, numerous suspects have emerged in the hunt for D.B. Cooper. The most likely suspect, probably Robert Rackstraw, old Bobber, retired pilot, ex-con, known liar who got kicked out of the military, had his wife leave him just months before the hijacking, someone who didn't tell uh, family members where he was going other than if he was going to the Pacific Northwest, someone who could have easily been in Portland, uh, that area, the day of the hijacking. Uh, Rackstraw lives now in the San Diego area, and his attorney has addressed the D.B. Cooper allegations, saying it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. All right, number five, new info. One more suspect whose name entered the fray just this past November. Uh, excuse me, the Oregonian reported on November 13th, uh, an anonymous Army data analyst sent off findings to the FBI pointing at a new suspect and stating that, in my professional opinion, there are too many connections to be simply a coincidence. The researcher determined a man named William J. Smith was the person who hijacked a commercial airliner in 1971 and then parachuted from the jet in a business suit with $200,000 in ransom money. Smith died when he was 89, but a yearbook of his, uh, of his included a list of alumni who were killed during World War II. One name jumped out according to the Oregonian, uh, Ira Daniel Cooper. Smith was a New Jersey native who worked at the Oak Island Rail Yard in Newark, the analyst determined. The anonymous analyst found Smith had served in the U.S. Navy, and the experience Smith gained working on the railroads would have helped him find railroad tracks and possibly hop a train back east after parachuting from the plane. I believe he would have been able to see Interstate 5 from the air, the analyst told the Oregonian, adding a rail line at the time ran parallel to the roadway. The analyst hypothesized that Smith and his wife, a woman named Dolores, may have been in on the hijacking together. Dolores retired at the fairly young age of 54. Uh, a grudge against Penn Central may have also been a motivating factor for Smith. The analyst told the Oregonian uh, Penn Central went bankrupt in 1970, leaving thousands without jobs. The analyst said anger at the corporate establishment may have driven Smith to undertake the hijacking. Uh, the Oregonian noted that the FBI had not responded to the data analyst research. The analyst also found several other links to bolster his theory. Uh, Smith had been stationed at one time in Fort Lewis in Washington State, 41 miles south of Seattle, and the FBI determined at the time of the hijacking that D.B. Cooper was likely familiar with the Seattle area. So just another name in a sea of possibilities, but I thought it was just kind of fun to include because of this theory that he hijacked a plane, parachuted out of it with 200 grand, then uh, found some train tracks, then hopped a train, and then, <laughs> and then rode the rails back to the East Coast. Like, if that really happened, maybe the coolest way anyone has ever pulled off a big heist. Uh, you know, don't steal. I'm not advocating that. But if you do steal, try to do it in a way even cooler than that so I can have another fun story to talk about. Time suck. Top five takeaways. D.B. Pooper Cooper mystery sucked. I hope if this mystery is ever conclusively solved that we find out he, he's just been living on a beach somewhere for years. And, uh, and, and that he said that he did it just to see if he could. Uh, big thanks uh, for, for uh, you know, to the Time Suck team for kicking off 2019 with me here. Uh, the High Priestess of the Suck, Harmony Bella Camp, Jesse Guardian of Grammar Dobner, Reverend Dr. Joe Paisley, Time Suck High Priest Alec Dugan, uh, the guys at Bit Elixir, Danger Brain, Space Lizards, Merch Wizards, Axis Apparel. So proud of all the fun, goopy stuff in the store. Uh, badass hoodies, Windbreakers, T-shirts, Challenge Coins, you know, so much more that... Uh, uh, if, if they're still there, the uh, A-Hole Air Banjo Academy shirt and a little uh, extra th funny, silly thing you get with that. Huge thanks, of course, to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins. Uh, huge thanks again to the Lily Twins, Reba and Sarah, Hammers and Knowledge, for digging up so much good mystery info. Uh, if you haven't already got in there and given it a shot, give the Cult of Curious, Cult of the Curious, excuse me, private Facebook group a try. Uh, over 5,700 Time Suckers and Spaces are in the private Cult of the Curious group now on Facebook. Uh, or you can try uh, Time Sucks Discord channel. Over a thousand Discord members now. Link to that uh, chat room messaging app right there on the Time Suck app. Uh, going historical next week. Talking about Cleopatra. What was she up to? What kind of shit was she getting into? Uh, according to History.com, Cleopatra ruled ancient Egypt as co-regent. First with her two younger brothers and then with her son for almost three decades. 
Uh, she became the last in a dynasty of Macedonian rulers, rulers founded by Ptolemy, who served as general under Alexander the Great during his conquest of Egypt in 332 BCE. Well-educated and clever, Cleopatra could speak various languages, served as a dominant ruler in all three of her co-regencies. Her romantic liaisons and military alliances with the Roman leaders Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, as well as her supposed exotic beauty and powers of seduction, have earned her an enduring place in history and popular myth. I like it. Smart, powerful, sexy, charming, influential. What's not to like? And she was Egyptian. Love an excuse to, uh, to learn me some more, uh, more about Egypt. So tune in, Meat Sacks. Get smarter, get smarter, or get smarter, or ist. Yeah, 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 hail Lucifina. Time now for some Time Sucker updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker updates. All right, D.B. Cooper update coming in already. This was uh, sent in prior to the show being released from Alabama Sucker Tyler Montgomery. Uh, Tyler writes, Mr. Suckmaster Supreme, Space Loser Tyler from Birmingham here. D.B. Cooper connection incoming. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and my dad's buddy sat two rows ahead of D.B. Cooper, that's cool as hell, on the flight when he demanded the money. After it all went down, he was one of the FBI's prime witnesses, but the funny thing is, he had no damn clue what was going on. So they kept asking him questions, and he had to be like, I don't know, he was a nondescript dude in a suit. Anyways, being from the Pacific Northwest, I've always believed he parachuted into the dense Douglas fir up there and got tangled in a tree. I don't think there's any other reasonable explanation for someone who was never seen again. Remember, just suck it through a hose. Keep on sucking. Well, well let me know. Let me know, Tyler, uh, what you think of this, if you learn anything new. Uh, or if you still think he's, he's hanging, his skeleton's hanging out in a tree somewhere there. Uh, that's awesome. You have a little connection to the episode. Uh, important shout-out request now for Summy coming in from caring friend Carly Kirk. Uh, Carly writes, hello, I do not usually do things like this, but a very dear friend of uh, to me has been quite down lately. I have reason to believe that she is considering suicide. That is scary. Uh, I've done what I can from my perspective. All of this to say I'm not asking for much. I'm not sure how long it takes to read things and when responses are added to the suck, but the friend, this friend and I bonded over the podcast and the love for the odd and the taboo and historical. We just love learning. Oh, that's, I like that. And I think it would brighten her day to hear something on here. And sometimes a little moment like this is all it takes to truly change a life. Anyway, as I said, I'm not asking much. Simply that in the responses of one episode, she receives this message. Summy, we have been through bad days, good days, heck even bad months. But we have learned that there's always a reason to keep pushing. Always a light, if you will. Even if it's just a compliment or the way the sun shines, there's something there. I hope this message gets to you and is that light I love you. Obviously, you don't have to feel obligated to do this or say it exactly like that. If you do, it's simply a favor, I suppose. Thank you. I uh, know what. Thank you, Carly. Thank you for uh, for just being a good reminder of of what a good person looks like. That is, uh, yeah, that is fantastic that you did that for your friend and Summy. If you're out there, don't don't do it. Don't let those dark thoughts take over your life. Uh, listen, listen to the previous two episodes. Listen, maybe they'll help a little bit. From uh, from over the holidays, you know, you, you can you can do a lot in life if, if you don't give up. And, and a lot can just be doing what your friend here did from you. Just, uh, you know, sending somebody a simple message to kind of turn their perspective around. So I hope you're okay. Uh, inspirational update from Jesse Stinton. Uh, Jesse writes, Hey, Master Sucker, I wanted to share a very personal update. I truly believe... Uh, I never would have lived to be a space lizard if not for Nick V. I included his email in the news story, uh, but I'll give a short version here. He basically came and spoke to the Marine Corps base camp Pendleton while I was there and going through some pretty tough shit. Feel free to share as much or as little of my story with Cold the Curious as you'd like. I'm sharing the whole, the whole message here. Uh, they even used me as the front page of his new newsletter. I saw that when I, when I opened up your uh, PDF there. I, I work security and I'm in a touchy area of... Uh, of technically correct, so I had them withhold my name. They used a fake name, but feel free to share with the Cult of the Curious. Also, a side note on the gun control update, if you start talking too much, you're getting too extreme with your view of restricting firearms for mentally ill people, where's the line? That is true. It can be a slippery slope. I know a lot of vets who don't get the PD, uh, PTSD help they need because they're afraid the VA will have the government take their weapons. I had a suicide attempt over 10 years ago without a firearm, and at one time may have been a danger to myself, but I'm not any longer uh, should I never be allowed to own a weapon again and by proxy not have my jobs that provide for my wife and two kids? Okay. That is that is a, a fair point to, to think about for sure. Uh, one at the time I wrote Nick. Uh, one kid at the time I wrote Nick. 
Uh, if you say, well, eventually what counselor will, will ever clear that and risk the liability of me shooting myself after they said I was okay? Uh, just one more complicated question for a complicated issue. Feel free to leave that part out for that. No, it, it's in there. I normally don't write in to be recognized and I'd say that I'm not, uh, I'm still not, but I hope that this is shared at least in summary so that Nick's work can be recognized and then even directly affected at least this member of Time Suck. If you do share also, please remind the Time Sucker that suicide is not the answer. Mm-hmm. Unless you're a pedophile piece of shit. Good asterisk. Uh, I've been suicidal. I've tried to end my life. Uh, and at the time, it felt more logical than emotional in my circumstances. But don't exit this world on that low note. Even if you don't think anyone else cares, you owe, your, owe it to yourself to go out on a better note than that. There's help. And if you keep fighting, things do get better. Sorry to be long-winded. But here's the correspondence with Nick. Okay, yeah, yes. Uh, and you sent the, new, the newsletter. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for sending that in. Man, I really appreciate that, Jesse. Uh, it was very nice, uh, kind of fitting after the previous message. Yeah, man, things can get better. And, and man, good thoughts. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought of uh, that angle about the um, necessarily like the slippery slope with the, uh, the gun regulation. Now, that is important to think about. I don't have an answer this moment, but it's important to think about. A uh, little more inspiration from uh, Haley Welton. Writes, uh, Haley writes, hello, Suckmaster. Hear this. I have and will have and will always be a huge fan of your comedy and podcast. I don't want to get dark with this message, but a couple years back, I really set my life back. I lost important people in my life. I didn't exactly have the strongest foundation growing up. I tried taking my life on my birthday. And fortunately for me, I'm still alive. So during the process of putting the pieces of my life back into place, I was having a hard time keeping my mind off of stuff. I decided to listen to some comedy stations on Pandora. Came across some old stand-up of yours. And some new stuff I hadn't heard. Fast forward two years later. I'm thrilled to get a laugh. Weird information. And a small escape every Monday. From the bottom of my heart, thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving me something to laugh about on some pretty shitty dark days. Keep sucking. You keep sucking, Haley. You know, I never intended to uh, to line these kind of messages up so three in a row uh, are addressing uh, the message of suicide, but it must be important. Nimrod, Nimrod's willing right now. Just, uh, just following uh, Nimrod's guidance. So we're going to end on some uh, sweetness from Brett Tayo. Uh, Brett writes, Dear Lord of the Suck, I just finished listening to episodes 119 and 120 yesterday, and I gotta say, the timing was pretty unreal for me. My wife and I just welcomed our fourth space newt, aw, to the family on New Year's Eve. Yes, I am aware that certain, uh, yes, I am aware that certain appendage has other uses. Okay, getting teased a lot for lots of kids. And, uh, and, and he was transferred to the NICU before he was 48 hours old. I won't go into details, but it is relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. The last couple of days have been tough as a dad, balancing work and spending time with my other children and still making time to go to the hospital to see him. It had me spiraling. I have never been one to put much stock in motivational speakers. To be honest, I always kind of felt like they preyed on the weaker members of society. No, yeah, me too. I've, I have that and I still have that feeling with a fair amount of them. Yes, they have helped people, but let's face it, how many have spent their life savings going to one seminar after another? Mm -hmm. After listening to those stories and the stop feeling sorry for yourself nut shot that came with them, I sat down with my new son and cried like a baby. Because as tough as things are right now, they will get better and he will be home soon. I listen to the suck religiously and have even gone back and re-listened to my favorites when I don't have a new episode and just want some sweet suck action. Uh, if my wife was more into that, we would, st <laughs> we would still have... Only three kids. I wish I had a little ta 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 ta. Please, if you can give a shout out to my wife, Sarah. Shout out, Sarah. Shout out to you. And my new newt, Kane. Hey, Kane. You get fucking out of the hospital, little dude. Get strong, space newt. And keep spewing hot steam and uh, suck steam right in our ear holes. Thanks, your ever loyal suck servant. Ah, oh, man. Well, thank you for sending that in. And I'm glad those uh, episodes helped. I know they were different. We're kind of back to more traditional type episodes now. But uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was nice. It just felt right to do those over the holidays this year. So I'm glad some of you really got some, uh, some, some good messages out of them. Finally, we get a lot of GoFundMe requests for, for a lot of very worthy causes. Too many to list and read out in episodes, uh, especially because they don't want to list some and then have other people feel like uh, they've been slighted with some kind of perceived favoritism. But please, post the GoFundMe uh, links you have for you know, the various causes that you are passionate about or rough things going on in your life to the Cult of the Curious uh, group on Facebook. That's the best place to do it. Uh, and then, you know, if you have extra to give and are looking for some good, worthy causes, please go to the Facebook, Cult of the Curious Facebook group and help other time suckers in need. Thank you, time suckers. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. First suck of 2019's in the suck bank, time suckers. Don't go hijacking any planes this week. 
It's not 1971 anymore, and your crazy ass will not pull it off. The FBI will not be giving you two parachutes. Just follow instructions and fly safe. Or even better, put your headphones on, cue up some suck, lie back, close your eyes, and just keep on sucking. Oh, shit.